Hey folks, Miguel Adorati back here on the MMA Museum podcast and we're in for another treat, another deep dive interview here. This time I've got Northwest boy Chris Wilson along with us and uh, this guy's kind of uh, an eclectic international guy. So we're going to have a fun interview here. Uh, I think he's got some great stories. He had a long career, um, started out in the Northwest area under the influence of guys like Chael Sonnen and Matt Linland. So kind of got introduced to the sport at a high level and uh we're gonna kick it off right here chris how you doing all right good to talk to you again miguel for sure chris good definitely good to see you man so okay. take us through this you're you're a little chris wilson are you do you wrestle in school do you you know are you a tough guy are you beating up people on the streets i, I get the impression that may not be your story tell us your story <laughs> um as a child and then we'll progress in the mma all right. Well, you got me pegged. That is definitely not, not my background. <laughs> I was never a bully and I was never, you know, getting, I wasn't getting purposely getting into street fights anyway, but um, I was uh, raised uh, as an early bilingual. I was raised in Brazil half my life. I went down there the first time when I was 10 months old. Wow. And then, you know, four years there, one here, four there, one here, back and forth. Um, I have a little over, I'm 46. I spent about 26 down there all together, but it was always back and forth. And I got involved in martial arts probably when I was 11. The first one I did, I think was Taekwondo. Okay. But it, it, you know, we didn't know any better back then. Nothing against Taekwondo, but I mean, like, we didn't know, you know, what should we do? Yeah. My, I, just, I wanted to do something and my dad was close to our house. So, you know, my dad didn't really know. And so he took me there. Um, but yeah, that was short lived. But you know, that just, I always kind of had an interest. And at the time we lived in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I would go to a little arcade close to the house. And there were some uh, street kids that would try to stick their hands in your pocket to take the, the coins out. They're not coins. They're specific for the machines. They're like Fisha. Fisha. Yeah. Fisha de <laughs> So, you know, and then I would stop them from doing it and they'd start pushing me around and I got punched by a couple kids and so I was like, no, I got to do some sort of martial art. And it kind of went from there, but then it, it became less about even defending myself and became more about, wow, what is this all about? And I did some Taekwondo and it was like, it was weird. There was a lot of kicking and I didn't feel like it was super realistic, but that's also because I wasn't that high of a level doing any sort of real sparring. Uh, so yeah, but it just went from there. And, so you did uh, Taekwondo yeah. in Brazil. Yeah, in Brazil. That was the first thing I did, but I only did it for about a year. And then I, you know, switched over and started doing other things. Okay. In other so so is your mom meeting. Brazilian or your dad Brazilian? No, no. Uh, my parents are both American from the Pacific Northwest and uh, they were Baptist missionaries. Ah, I got you. Yeah. So. Okay. It's very interesting. Actually, it was um, a missionary that's sort of responsible for a lot of this. Um, it was one of the missionaries that first met Pedro Sauer in Brazil and brought Pedro up to Utah, you know, where the, oh, there was yeah, a lot yeah. of that, um, where, you know, a lot of guys went to big places. And then how did Pedro Sauer wind up in Utah because of a missionary that, that you know, and, and that's where Hicks and Gracie fought Mark Schultz in a gym and mm -hmm. and uh, and that stuff. So, um, well, I knew I knew Pedro Sauer went to the United States. Of course, everyone knows Pedro Sauer. He's a legend. But I didn't know it was because of that. Yeah, that's yeah, cool. it was a it was a missionary guy. Mark Schultz gave me his name. Actually, I, I it'll escape me right now, and I don't want to get it wrong. But, um, but yeah, so that that's interesting. That's very so that's yeah. and you so you always spoke Portuguese fluently. And, uh, um, how come you? Yeah, like, it, it, it just when you learn a language from that age, yeah, it, it is a first language for you. But since my parents are American and we spoke English in the house and English with our friends. So English remained a first language as well. That's kind of right. what being early bilingual is. So yeah, if I don't tell people in Brazil that I'm American, they won't know. I I can I can really get I can really pass. Like other languages, no, but cool, in, cool. In Portuguese, no, that, I can do it. Yeah. That's really amazing. Where was your education mostly? Did you go to school in Brazil more than in the States? Well, I mean, everywhere that I lived, I went to school, of course, because right. you know, you're always in school. So uh just yeah, the time that I was there, I was Growing up, I went to elementary down there, like kindergarten in the States, first four down there, fifth grade in the United States, six through nine down there, or six through eight down there, nine through high school here, 
a couple years of college, stopped college, went back to Brazil um, because at that point I was an adult and I wanted to visit because I had childhood friends there, you know? Yeah. So I wanted to visit the country as an adult. I wanted to see my friends. I wanted to work. I wanted to live. I wanted to see what it was like. And so I came back down, I think when I was, or I went back down when I was 19, um, stayed for, you know, overstayed my visa <laughs> and then I was illegal. So now I'm like, and you know, it's funny because every 20 years or so, most countries will do an amnesty. Yeah. They'll say, Hey, you know, and the person that I was living with, they're family friends. And he, he brought me a newspaper clipping that I still have. It said, you know, th that the government was doing the amnesty thing, which is normal every couple decades. They do the amnesty for people illegal between these dates. And I was between those dates. So I went down to the federal police, got my permanent visa back, which I had always had, you know, mm -hmm. got my permanent visa back. And then I was able to remain in the country legally again and just uh, went from there. Okay. Now at 19, when you went down there and stuff, they, fighting still wasn't, you know, professional fighting still wasn't in the picture yet. Or were you already thinking that along those lines? I, I wasn't fighting professionally. Um, I would, I had, I had been training something for a long time. Um, but, but really fighting professionally started when I got back from okay. Brazil and started living in the United States again. Um, but I did fight, I did train and fight while I was down there. Okay. I was and doing jujitsu. I did Aikido for several years too. And I would do more than one at the same time. Like, sure. So. Yeah. Sure. Now, who were you, who was your earliest jujitsu influence that that you would credit with with helping you out down there? Um, when I first started jujitsu, and it was on that trip when I came back down when I was uh, nineteen or twenty or whatever, I started at a gym where many of my friends were, and at the time it was a guy named Shevachi, but he was just the in between guy. Uh, before Hobson Moda got there. Okay. Hobson Moda, I'm sure, yeah. I mean, Hobson And uh, Hobson, it, it's ironic because he lives here in Tampa. I'm in Tampa. He okay. lives here in Tampa now. Wow. He has for a decade or more. Or more. But um, yeah, so Hobson was, was teaching at that gym. And then he had, and I left again because I'm leaving and coming back for my whole life. And then he had some black belts that he created with Jean Hotondaru and Andre Oshirubira. Andre Oshirubira ended up being my coach, and that's who I trained with most. And that's where I got my black belt was with Andre. So okay. I, I, I kind of come from Hobson Moda. Okay. Um, and yeah. for context. And, but, even though he, go ahead. but even though he lives here in Tampa, he's so far away that I'm unable to train with him. So oh, that kind of sucks. But I'm at a great gym, Pejipanu, Marcio Cruz. Oh, sure. Yeah, okay. It's a mile from my house. Uh, honestly, I've been doing mostly stand up again just because I don't have a lot of time and so I haven't trained jiu jitsu that much for a while. But yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I, uh, you know, I'm friends with Chris Lytle and Lytle in his old age, yeah, you know, in his guy. 40s actually did um, the bare knuckle stuff. And he oh, said one sure. of the reasons for it, all, you know, aside from the, the rush and, and the, that feeling again, was that training stand up alone is a, sometimes a little easier on the body you know because that grind of being on the right. ground and stuff like that on so your that's joints and your back yeah yeah and and uh just for context for the people out there uh marcio pedipano you know he fought Multiple ufc he's probably yeah he's probably a guy that's better known than hobson mora but hobson mora i think eclipses him in world championships you know well, and, he's and a that's, little guy that's yeah what well, I'm I'm thinking in terms of jujitsu, those are two of the best that the sport has produced. Yeah, you know what I mean. So I mean, I think because uh, Hobson he fought in Japan and he had fewer MMA fights. Yeah, I think for MMA enthusiasts, uh, you know, Bajipan would definitely be more. Recognized. Yeah, Hobson was a little small. He's a oh. 135 pounder, and he probably. Came was before it 35? The... Oh, I thought he was 20, 125. Yeah, yeah he was he was definitely a little guy. 60, and that's 61, the point is he was one kilos or sixty-six. I don't remember. He's a guy that um kind of was a little older. He he came before like the influx of the weight classes legitimately and stuff like that. I'll tell you a funny story about him. I I I uh I judged the Abu Dhabi trials down there that he okay. won when he went to Abu Dhabi, and um 
he was so excited about winning, he had taken off his wedding ring and left it on the judges' table oh, uh, <laughs> to compete. And then when he was so excited, he left. I gave him his wedding ring back the next day. And he nice. was, like, so happy. <laughs> yeah, so, good so, man, good man. You probably saved him uh, a, know, lot. <laughs> a couple months of hardship and some more money. But, yeah, that's worse. Coming from the wife, oh, you for you 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 lost your ring. Yeah, that's and, wonderful. You won the tournament, but <laughs> yeah, you lost your wife. No, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so I actually, when you mentioned his name, it, it just brought back memories too. He's a and legitimate guy. He, he, he didn't just oh, go man. to the trials; he won the trials. You know what I mean? Man, I'll be rolling with him. Like I've had the opportunity to roll with a couple people in my time, and him. Damian Maya, my instructor, uh, Ushirubira, Andrea Ushirubira, and Pej Banu, these guys, you know, it's just playfully, but kind of true. It's, it's like trying to swim up a waterfall. It's just, it feels so, you feel, you, you're in water, so you mm -hmm. feel like, you know, uh, <laughs> you're yes. done. You're not getting anywhere. You know what I mean? If they really want to bring it on, it's, it's rough. That is a rough roll with those guys. Yeah, yeah, and you're getting... so many steps ahead. Habib, it's like you said, he's tiny, but he's so many steps ahead of you. Yeah, you know what I mean. And you, the you, speed. He, he's fin he finesses everything. He doesn't have a choice. He has to finesse things. Yeah. you know what I mean. I'm not gonna if I go in there and try to power him around. It's not gonna work. Yeah, he's yeah, he's he, he's a he's a uh, at at the time of the trials, I think he, they introduced him as a five time world champion. You know, so mm -hmm. um, definitely. Uh, great people. So, okay. So you've got your foundation in martial arts, several martial arts, including BJJ. Now you head back up to Portland. How do you hook up with team quest? Because you were with, uh, Matt Linland and, and Chael Sonnen and stuff up there. That's where you, you started out your fight career on Chael show. You did a bunch of fights on, on Matt's show. Um, how did you hook up with them? Did you know them from the past or, or was it something that you sought them out? Well, the timeline is a little skewed there because we started talking about it. But like at that point, I hadn't done all that training in jujitsu yet. I had trained jujitsu, but not as much. That right. was, The rest of that jujitsu training happened when I went back down to Brazil and I trained for another eight years. You know what I mean? Like I, that was where I started in that same town but I only trained for a few years before I went back to the United States. So I went back to the United States and to team quest um, as a striker, pretty much who had some jujitsu, you know, I might, I might've been a blue belt, you know, mm -hmm. you know, okay. I got my purple belt in Brazil the next time I went back down, but I had also been doing submission wrestling a lot in at team quest when I went back down to Brazil. But the point is, um, you know, I was mostly a striker. I ended up teaching striking at Team Quest for a long time also. And uh, but I went to Team Quest originally because I wanted to continue with that MMA stuff at the time. Um, and Team Quest was it's in Gresham, Oregon, and which is right beside Portland. It's a Portland suburb. So I lived, you know, in Vancouver through high school. But then I went back and I was living in portland so i trained at team quest and at the time it was randy couture matt linland chael sonnen evan tanner chris lieben uh ed herman and uh ryan schultz you know ian loveland came a little a little later um dan henderson would come up because he already didn't he, you know he didn't live there but he came up quite a bit at the beginning um and then you know out of respect couture went down and formed extreme couture and uh you know out of respect to now, I, I don't want to get his name wrong, but they also had kind of a secret weapon coach that uh that passed away. That I, oh, Robert Fallis. The, yeah. Robert Fallis. That, that he was, that's yeah. yeah. He was yeah. he was he was like a brother to me. He was like he was my mentor for a long time. He kind of took me under his wing and I ended up doing, you know, Team Quest. He was a big part of what kept Team Quest running and growing, you know, because uh, Randy and Matt, they're fighters, uh, but they didn't have as much business acumen. So uh, when they brought Robert in at the beginning, it was mostly to have a training partner. Robert was interested and he provided a body for them to train on. And then, you know, but then he kind of took the reins of the business and grew the gym. And so Team Quest really flourished a lot when, you know, 
when yeah. he partnered with them uh and he learned a lot from being that guy yeah that was just really sad i i had already left um when that happened but yeah yeah, that, that, yeah it's, it's really unfortunate and I, but i have good memories of him i like to bring him up because he's yeah, one of those too. secret weapon kind of people that you know you're right i i think added a lot more to that gym than than people would know i remember him showing up at fights with a notebook and, and making yeah. notes and making notes you know just writing about like you know and he had scouting reports on people who knows yeah. what he was writing but it well, worked and he would also <laughs> Yeah, he would, you know, that's interesting, but it wouldn't always be fighting specific. Lots of times it would be something strategic or it would be something mental. And that was part of what made it so cool is that you would sit down, you would have a conversation with him about, uh, you know, somebody's reactions or their motivations or their psychology or their, um, you know, their mental state during a fight or why they reacted one way for this and not for that or you know what I mean? That was really interesting about him too. I yeah. ended up doing uh, an instructor's course at Team Quest where, you know, I graduated from the course and I later went on to teach that instructor's course. And, you know, we would read books about performance and about sports and we would read, you know, other books about philosophy and things like that. So it was, it was interesting. I mean, it was, yeah. uh, it was a very formative time for me. Yeah. When I talk, when I talk to anybody that ran into that new Robert Follis, you know, you get the sense that his influence is still there with us, you know? So that, that's why, you know, much respect to him and, and when he comes up. So, yeah. um, <laughs> I got a lot of stories with him, as you can imagine, because, you know, well, sure, sure was, one with us. Main, well, he was my main coach for a long time. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I, I could share many, but I'm just saying I'm, he was a big part of my fighting career. So, you know, he was with me for most of the time that I was until I moved back to Brazil, you know, yeah. Did he come down and corner you when you fought it down here in, in Costa Rica? Not to skip ahead oh, too no, much. No. But... I was I didn't fight. I uh the Bodog card in Costa Rica wasn't I wasn't on that one. Okay. But he well, he did go down there. I think he went down with Jake Ellenberger. I got you. Yeah, yeah. Now yeah. who did where'd you fight in Bodog? I fought in uh Vancouver for Bodog, I fought in Vancouver. Yeah. Okay, I got you. Okay. So yeah, yeah, I yeah let's Steinbeis. Just... Ray Steinbeis. That is the I think that is the one fight that I don't have in my library. Oh really? It's gone. It's gone. Yeah. It's gone. Yeah, the Bodog Library is, is kind of hard to uh track down and stuff. They took it all offline yeah. or the most of it is offline and um I believe it was it's actually the UFC bought it and you know has Burned it socked it. away so yeah, you know. Yeah. They're, they're not Story doing anything life. with it. So that that's a shame, but let's take it back here. So uh You've been at Team Quest. You're you're training with these guys. Now you're around high level guys, at, yep. and this is around 2003, 2004. These guys are already starting to come out onto you know the fighting scene. You're in an active. Co you may, you take the step to actually get in the ring, and uh, your first fight is on a Chael Sonnen run show called Rumble at the Roseland, which yep, is yep, right yep. right in Portland, and. Uh, Talk about that fight. The uh, first fight is Elder Pyatt, I believe. Yeah, Elder Pyatt. Basically, I I went out there. I had never fought MMA. Went out there. He was a super short guy, but at the time, you know, I wasn't. I was physically, I was a lot thinner. You know, I hadn't really done a lot of strength training. I hadn't done uh, any kind of real focused performance training. I had always been a striker. You know, trained and fought but never at a pro level. You know, I was, mm -hmm. I was getting into MMA. That was my first MMA fight. Yeah, competition went out is there, different. Yeah. yeah. Went around the ring a couple of times and he was, so he was quite a bit shorter than me. And I think I threw, uh, I, I threw a fake jab right cross and knocked him down. And that was it. TKO 10 second fight. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's always good to get a win and always, you yeah. know, good that way. But um, you know, a, a lot of the times you like to get a little more out of a fight than that. that and, uh, yeah. obviously you, you jump back into it relatively quickly. Cause that fight was December 13th. And then on January 3rd, you fought another show up in the Northwest. So, um, you want to get like right it. back into it. This is something <laughs> called PPKA ultimate fight night three, Joey Rubio. Oh yeah. Yeah. Rubio. Yeah. So, uh, what, what do you remember about this? I, let me. Let, I'm, I'm clicking here. I'll have more information for you in a second here. But this, uh, what, this fight, it was in Yakima. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. 
Um, and just to, uh, that, and show... that's where yeah. that's where I think I, we actually I mentioned it before. At the time, it was so long ago. There wasn't really um, a distinction really between amateur and pro. You know, what I mean, we weren't wearing headgear. We weren't re- wearing shin guards and stuff. It was, uh, yeah. So Joey Rubio, he had he had had pro fights before. I think he I think he had only had pro fights. I don't remember what his record was. But I think he only had a couple pro fights because they're getting paid. I think that was the only distinction was if they got paid or not. Yeah. Um, and yeah, went in there and I won that fight. Yep, you won the fight. Uh, it, was, it was in the second round, so you you, yeah. you had a little more ring. We got time a little then. bit more time. Yeah. Um. I, I honestly, that was a second fight. It, sure. I don't okay. remember anything. No, my time outside of the ring, the trip to Yakima. The restaurant we went to, those were more, more notable things, I think, than the fight for some reason. Okay. That's what stuck in my head. Uh, you know, at that time, when you're fighting, you're a little bit adrenalized and you're just out there, you know, doing your best. <laughs> so, <laughs> sure. It's hard and, to remember details of those fights for me. Yeah. But the thing about the Northwest is that, uh, you know, Yakima means to me, you know, you had guys like Dennis Hallman, Anthony Hamlet. Was, so was, I, think was, it was, I think it was Hamlet's show. Okay, so, and those are, you know, once again, it's solid people. So you're you're not yeah. you, you manage to avoid the fighting in strip joints kind of <laughs> uh, yeah. aspect of it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and and they're sort of in a mid level uh, already. So uh, you get your feet wet. Um, you you get another win. So now you're two and zero. Oh. Um, mm-hmm. how was the uh? You know, you said you had Robert kind of guiding you uh, and stuff like that there. Did you ever feel like, okay, Linland, he's already at a high level and, you know, he's a guy that wants to move his career forward fast. You know, Chael was getting ready to explode kind of thing. Uh Um, Did you feel like uh, you were floating under the radar there for a little bit or or did you Um, feel you were getting enough attention? Yes, yes, but I needed to be. I needed to be. That wasn't a time to really push me into bigger fights than I was fighting. I was still at the beginning, even though I had some striking experience. Um, I, I wasn't ready for to fight the toughest guys. Um, you know, that's interesting because that happened to some people in our region. What was his name? Eddie, Eddie Ellis. I actually fought Eddie Ellis, lost to him. But this this is an 18-year-old kid with 30 fights or so who had been in there with some wolves. Had, you know, or yeah. He, so it's like I remember when I fought Eddie, I was in there. He's a young kid, quite a bit younger than me. But he's just he's just bouncing around like he was, he was in his living room, and I'm like, you know, still Nervous. got that adrenaline going. I've only had a few fights, and like I could barely see anything b- below like chest level. I was just like, you know, still taking it all in. It was still a lot for me, and he had so many fights, and so yeah, I mean, I I survived basically, you know, and he he elbowed me to the back of the head it cut me open illegal move yes i don't remember if you lost the point or not but it cut me open and then i was bleeding so i had that ferrous smell the iron from the Mm -hmm. blood and like i had blood on me and i could smell it and i couldn't get him off my back you know what i mean like he was Mm -hmm. able to get my back a couple times so i just kind of survived three rounds through that fight lost the fight but that was a crazy learning experience like yeah, how that whole thing happened, but yeah, so I wasn't yeah. really, I think, and I'm not upset that I got put with a guy with that much more experience. It was, you know, that's kind of kind of thing that happens sometimes. It was a chance for me to get tested, but also they needed an opponent for him. But it was a it was a chance for me to get tested. Some people objected to me being put against somebody with that many fights, despite me being older. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, well, experience makes look, a big difference, back, you know. It does, it does. And in that fight, it definitely did. But looking back, I, I don't begrudge the matchmaking, really. Honestly, I don't. Okay, and we're gonna we're gonna get to that because you're you're a guy that in a way you're starting in 2003, 2004, but in a way you took the kind of path that guys did, you know, maybe a few years earlier, and that is rush into like a bunch of fights because you fought uh December 13th, your debut, January 3rd. Then you were back in the ring in the UFCF, which might have been yeah. Matt Hume's show, Janu- yeah, end exactly, of January. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, good call. It was Matt Hume's show. Yeah, up in, I think it was Everett. 
Yeah. That's a funny one. I have that on the video. I fought Chris Young. I remember that fight specifically because we did wear um, shin guards. I think he forced us to wear shin guards. Okay. And uh, the, the the cloth ones. But my son, my 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 firstborn, Lucas, uh, he was there with my wife in the crowd. And when I won, she lifted him up, and you can see the his back in the camera. Like she's holding up my kid. But yeah, I finished Chris with a triangle. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I remember that fight. I remember that fight. Close, and that, that. So now you're, you know, you're doing some things. You're, you're you're racking up wins early on, which is a good thing. Um, and then you know, in February you're back in the ring. So you have four fights in less than three months, uh, Scott. Hoyer in uh, SF, which is Sport Fight, which is Linland's show. So Linland comes back, starts off his show, and you're on the very first Sport Fight uh, mm -hmm. on the card. And uh, this was another one of those uh, knockouts in under 20 seconds. So uh, you notched another win. Uh, do you remember mm -hmm. this this fight and, and fighting on Linland's show? What what kind I remember of level fighting was this? on the I remember fighting on the card. I I, re I vaguely remember what the guy looked like, but I don't remember how the fight. Uh, how the fight went on okay um like you're telling me it was a quick knockout i i had i had a good amount of striking experience i felt pretty comfortable striking my problem was being able to execute i had throughout my career a little bit of performance anxiety okay you know, i was always be i was always better in the gym than i was in my fights even so i was able to perform well enough to grow and to win some good you know get some good wins but i always felt like i you know i had a hurdle that i was always struggling to overcome which was yeah. that performance anxiety yeah it's and you know i i don't know if you know jay jack and amanda buckner uh, uh, but yeah yeah uh, by name by, i know both of them and I don't uh, know them yeah and uh they talk about that where like there came a point in their career where they actually broke through that anxiety with a, a psychologist and were doing work on it and it definitely mm -hmm. is something that um can have an effect on you especially yeah. um around the high level people that you're in there, mm -hmm. you know, you're proving it in the gym, but then you're alone in the ring and, right. you know, everybody adjusts to it differently. And you were at least four and oh, getting to, to the point where, um, you, you know, you're maybe getting on the radar stuff. And then, uh, Matt, at least, at you, least regionally, regionally. Yeah, yeah. Right. And then Matt in his second show, put you in against the guy, Cam Ward, that I mm -hmm. think also had, had you on experience in, and you take a split decision loss here. Mm -hmm. Um, what Cam, do you remember Cam, about this? Cameron. Fight? Yeah, no, Cam's a good guy too. I like him at the time, you know, he was kind of, you know, when he would talk to other people or you'd, he would do any sort of media for, um, for his, his fights are, he kind of seemed like he was kind of full of himself, but then when you talk to him, he's normal. He's, he's a good guy, respectful. He, you know, it was like kind of one of those early, um, it was my early impression of kind of a little bit of what Chael does a little bit, you know, like mm -hmm. Chael's the nicest guy in the world, uh, but like, then he talks about putting somebody's picture in his shoes so he can step on their face all day. You know, what I mean? <laughs> Cam didn't do it that much, but it's just, you know, I, I some of the things Cam would say, I'd be like, I don't know if I would say that that way, but whatever. But yeah, no, Cam's tough. And he was, he came from um, Scott, uh, I hate it, I forget people's names, but I'm, I'm retarded. Scott, his last name, I can't remember his last name. It's, it's the gym that they're from. And But anyway, so uh, Enoch Wilson, I think, and Cam Ward were both from the same. Okay. I'm I feel gonna... so stupid, I forgot. But um it's a uh, judo jiu-jitsu is it tiger or two all in judo jiu-jitsu yeah club? it says oregon jiu-jitsu on oregon i'm Jiu sure, yeah. sure dog here uh oregon I, I, I don't but, recognize a well, ton of the, the names but yeah the, the point is he was uh he was you know he was at the time i think you know he won some some fights uh he he was a pretty good you know yeah mid-level guy he was doing his career i was very surprised to find that he stopped fighting so early on um you know cam yeah. he got some wins and then he he hung them up and pursued a career in something else i don't know what but yeah now you said you were skinny at this point are you are you fighting in the lightweight division you're at 155 here no no i've always i i fought 170 my whole okay. career the okay. difference is that when i fought my first fight I walked in at 170 because I didn't 
I didn't eat the day before, you know, and then yeah. I, I, I think that fight, Jerome Isaacs, did you see Jerome Isaacs on there? Uh, it Tacoma? Yeah, no, but go ahead, continue. Yeah, it's a little bit after, it was a few fights forward. Okay. But I think that fight was the first fight that I had to cut weight, and it's hilarious, because I was cutting to like 175. It was so <laughs> stupid. You know what I mean? Like, and at the time I was like, oh, cut weight so hard. Now I get it. Now I understand. I didn't understand shit. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, that I would was... understand several years down the road, but like cutting from 175 and Robert Falls is sitting there. With, we're in a restaurant and Robert Falls is sitting there with Simon. He just starts cracking up. He's like, would you shut the fuck up? Yeah. I, I remember. Like, what do you mean, man? This sucks. He's like, what? That you have to eat salad with chicken with not a lot of salt on it? What? What? <laughs> What sucks? Yeah, yeah. Like, Especially with Chael and guys like that. I was with, <laughs> uh, you know, I remember Falls coming with Chael to, uh, and Chael did a lot of weight cutting. Yeah. And Chael sitting there in a, a um, you know, the bag and a suit and stuff like suit, that. Yeah. And uh, he had bought uh, like a PlayStation with him to the hotel. And he's playing PlayStation in the suit. <laughs> right. We're looking for him, and and he's doing that. And yeah, you fought Isaac's about a year later. So yeah. you go through you, with the Cam Ward fight. It was a split decision. It was there any hard feelings about that? You know, did you think uh, maybe you won the fight, or I, at this I, point I you're taking I, it I thought I did enough to win. There weren't hard feelings, but I did think I did enough to win. And you know, sometimes when you lose split decisions, you're like, who was the judge? You know, like what, yeah. where where was the judge from? Like it's just like yeah. I, I was upset that I lost the split decision, but it was good enough fight that, you know. Yeah. And, you know, 15 minutes, you hadn't, you didn't have 15 minutes total ring time yet. Yeah. You know, so at the end of the day, you probably will, will, you know, in the long run, find it a more valuable experience in the early yeah. fights, you know. Yeah, I've been, I benefited from being in there for a little longer, for sure. Yeah, and, and now your team, um, obviously saw something in you or felt it was time for another step up because they took you to a fight in Denmark. It looks like mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, the Denmark fight uh, is against a, a fellow named Stel Nyang. And... Yeah. Stel Nyang. Okay. <laughs> the, the, there's the master linguist. There. <laughs> <laughs> now this, this list is a no contest and it doesn't give any time or anything like that. So it's up to you to tell the people what happened in Denmark. What's going on All right. there? Well, well, the funny thing about Denmark is that, you know, early in your career, if you're going to go that far to fight in a foreign country and they're bringing you, like that was my first experience of really in the fight world, someone taking you from where you are, paying for you to fly somewhere and paying you to fight, like that was a big deal to me. And, you know, it was kind of nerve wracking. I went with Dennis Davis, and the piranha, and uh and robert and just at that point in my career i was getting nervous before the fight there was no way to watch tape on this guy like who is he and you know you build things up sometimes especially early on in your career you build your opponent up like he's gonna come in and he's gonna shoot lightning out of his hands or something okay <laughs> you don't know anything yeah and then it was hilarious that we were sitting in the hotel room the day before weigh-ins because they took us a couple days early to adjust and you know we walked around and saw copenhagen uh but the night before weigh-ins they we t we were clicking through tv stations and they were showing an event and my guy was on the event oh wow okay and, and so i watched him for a sec he won the fight but i was watching him and i was like he's just another guy he's just some guy he doesn't have any, you know, special powers. You know, you build yeah. things up in your head to where sure. you get yourself all hot and bothered. Like, no, he's just some guy. I'm going to whoop this kid's ass. <laughs> yeah. Good, so, good. Well, the, the, the no contest, what happened was we went in, first round, started fighting, uh, exchanged some, ex exchanged a little bit. Um, I don't remember if I slipped on a kick or something, but I was on the ground on my back and I was kind of looking for a chance to get up and he was kind of hovering over me, didn't let me get up, but he wasn't coming in to top position. And so I was trying to up kick. Well, when I up kicked, 
he claims that my pinky toe from my foot hit him in the eye. Well, he took that as an opportunity to say he was unable to continue. I I I I believe he wanted out of the fight. I don't okay. think you know, just the way that things had gone until then, I was very confident because the night before I was like, oh, this kid's just another kid. I'm gonna whoop this little blonde kid's ass. And I proceeded to start doing exactly that. I think he felt some pressure. And when I ended up on the ground, I think I slipped from a kick. When I ended up on the ground, he was like hesitant. And then when I up kick, it did hit him here. It did. But I mean, then he's, you know, he, he did all the thing and like, you know, oh, you know, come on. And then, you know, they gave him five minutes. He's like, oh, five minutes. And, and there was a little hometown cook in there because, you know, he, he, they weren't going to give him a loss for not being able to continue, but they're, you know, because it was an illegal strike, uh, you know, a toe to the eye, sure. but they're not going to give him the win because I didn't try to hit him in the eye. I was just trying, I was trying to stand up. Actually, I just threw one up kick to, you know what I mean? Yep. So they ruled it a no contest. I, I didn't like, I didn't like, he wasn't hurt that bad. You could tell, you know, we can tell as fighters, he wasn't hurt that bad. His yeah, eye was yeah. swollen afterward. I mean, yeah, it was a little red, but yeah, and you, you know, if if your toe or finger digs in, you you kind of get the sense. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I can feel it if I'm knuckled deep in somebody's eye. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So that's an interesting thing. Now, you 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 mentioned anxiety, nice guy, though. and, and right. you know, Denmark is, is beautiful. So you had like a nice experience overall, and you, I think, you know, you're talking about anxiety. I think you took a step here too, because you know, you were nervous before the fight. Then you saw him and, and, and you had a, a reaction that was a good reaction. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, you were ready to do business and you do get that sense of like, this guy's got to be shooting, you know, lightning out of his fingers because mm -hmm. why are they bringing somebody, you know, why pay for somebody to come in unless they think he's a prospect or unless they mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you adjusted to all that. Now, mm -hmm. um, did uh, elevated your confidence. It did. I I mean, the I did not like the result, but I like the experience. That was, you know, it, it moved me forward. Like you said, uh, psycholog psychologically it, and emotionally, I thought that that was a good thing for me. Um, yep. Yeah, it just it wasn't the result that I wanted. So you started in December of 2003. That by the time we got to the Cam Ward fight, you were uh, four and one in March. So you you were speeding through fights. Then you did take a couple months off to go to Denmark. And then a month later, you're in against Eddie Ellis again in sport fight. Obviously, um, you know, you're on kind of Linlin's show, who's a teammate, and they think highly enough of you to put you in with some good people. But you said, you know, Eddie had the 30 fights. Um, you know, yeah. his wife fights. His wife has another 30 fights, you know, so yeah. um, that, that sort of Lisa, stuff. Lisa, right? Lisa Ward? Yeah, Lisa yeah. Lisa Ellis. Uh, or, um, oh, yeah, Lisa Ellis, I'm sorry. And, and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Good stuff there. Uh, we talked a little bit about that fight. That he won a unanimous decision, so you, you're not getting well stopped. deserved. Well deserved. I mean, I like I said, I, I kind of survived that fight. Um, but yeah, um, it was Linland's show. I mean, I there part of it was you know believing in me and putting me in there because you know they wanted to see what I would do against somebody with that amount of experience. You know, they train with me all the time. They know uh, what I might be able to do, but can I? And, you know, yeah. And, and it's like I said, that that's a, that's the kind of match that it was, it was okay for me. I didn't, I don't begrudge the matchmaking, but it was also not just looking out for me, not just testing me. It was also, you know, Eddie needs a fight. We yeah. got a guy, a lot less experienced, but he's one of our guys. You know, people like him. It's it's good. It's, it'll promote well for a you know a beginning sport fight. You know. Yeah, and, and and you know, I look at it. I'm you know, I dabble in matchmaking, so I know. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, um, I know, knew you got, as a matchmaker, in fact. Right, right, exactly. And the the thing is, to me, is I can like a guy and not like the other guy or whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, with the purity of it as a promoter matchmaker, you've got to be ready for either guy to win. You know what That's I mean? Right, it's not yeah. like, Oh, the guy I didn't want to win one. So now, you know, I'm not going to bring him back anyway. You know, you've got some obligations to bring people along. And obviously mm -hmm. 
They maybe had worked with Eddie before. He's a known quantity in that area. And, you know, with 30 fights, you know, you got to say, probably he didn't have a lot of people taking care of him either. You know what I mean? So, well, I, um, he was, he was, uh, <clears throat> damn it, I forget. Uh, not Anthony Hamlet. We just talked about him. We, about Holman? Month. Holman, yeah, Dennis Holman, Superman. I just names escaping sometimes. Um, yeah. but yeah, so he was Holman. Holman really he threw him to the wolves, you know, as, yeah. a, as a young up and comer. And, he fought some other guys who also had 20, 25 fights when he had five or 10, you know what I mean? So he kind of had that happen to him as well. Yeah. Holman was a guy that, um, you know, I know him very well. And he's yeah, a guy been... that, uh, you know, was elite, you know, I mean, yeah. he, he, he beat Matt Hughes and then beat Matt Hughes again, you know, yeah. while Hughes was at the top of the game. So he was an elite guy. And I think that that, Victory athletics. A lot of the time, you know, makes it hard for you to manage people. You know, you can be very demanding and not everybody's going to be able to do it. And Holman also had this ability, I think, I think just as an observer, where the first time you felt him, he he had an unusual game where he could catch people, you know, then maybe you could get used to him in training and stuff like that. But he could be amazingly tricky in, yeah. in the very beginning of a fight. So that's a great, it, that's a great read on Holman. Holman would come down, you know, we were all friends in the Pacific Northwest. We all knew each other, you know, him, Ivan Salivary. I mean, Ivan, Ivan didn't come down, but we all, we knew him, you know, we all knew yeah. each other, but Holman would come to team quest every once in a while. He was friends with everybody. He was, you know, very personable, um, very gregarious. So, yeah, I mean, I agree with, I agree completely, you know, yeah. when you, cool. when you watch him train in, well, that, that affirms it because all I'm doing is watching. When you tell me I'm right, I I I, I get comfortable that hey, I I, yeah. I didn't know a little something. He's, um, no, he's he's very he's very skilled. Yeah, it's funny Almost you mentioned really Ivan Salvary. Uh, Salvary's Chilean also, so we we, uh, we hit it off pretty well. Yeah, um, and uh, interestingly, just as a quick side note, um, Matt Hume had a bad relationship with the UFC by the time Ivan was getting there, so. On record, I was his manager. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, so, yeah. so I Makes knew sense. those guys, you know, people fooling around trying to get advanced in their career. You're talking about elite guys there, you know. So after the Eddie Ellis fight, now you kind of do what a lot of guys that are serious do. And it's like, OK, you know, you, you accepted the loss. You're not, you know, mentally crippled by it. But you do take nine months off. Now, was this like to take it to the next level and 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 was that the the reason you took some time off or was there an injury what was the reason that you stopped this hyper uh, activity um well part of it, it was just if you're not hurt and there is an opportunity why not take it especially if we're fighting fights that are developmentally sound like um ideally you want to have a fight where if you don't perform well you'll lose if you perform to your ability, it'll be close or you'll win. You know what I mean? And those, those are the kinds of fights you should be taking always, really. Um, and that your manager should be watching out for you to get and talking to matchmakers. And when he describes who you are as a fighter, what kind of experience you have, how you perform, that's the kind of fight he should be looking for when he talks to matchmakers. Well, um, I felt like that was going on. After the Eddie Ellis fight, I was like, all right, that was a bit much, but, you know, I don't remember, honestly, if I had an injury or if I had just things going on in life. Because, again, I was already a little older. I had a family. I already had a wife and at least one kid. And one kid. Okay. You know what I mean? So, yeah. at this point, I'm, you know, I have obligations. It, it was it was hard for, you know. Yeah. I, yeah. I had to make a lot of sacrifices. And my, my wife made a lot of sacrifices in order for me to be able to train as much as I had to train and you know fight as much as i had to fight and teach i was teaching and i was uh bartending and you know i worked at the airport so it was just a, it was a lot and that yeah. might might have contributed but i don't remember a specific injury at that time okay. i'd have to go back and like remember all my injuries you know what i mean sure sure no no problem and and with a nine month layoff it's not extreme but there is time time for some growth there now you That's return right. at sport fight nine and this is Damien Hatch. 
Yeah. Uh, and this this fight funny, took funny a, story, a funny story there too. <laughs> you give it to us because this is a three round fight where you, you took him out in the third. Yeah. So uh, the I fight was exhausted too. But <laughs> like um we had a guy Damien was from Damien Hatch, great guy. Um, but he was from Bend, Oregon. Okay. Uh, that's over, you know, with, um I don't remember who he was training with, but um like JT Taylor was over there who had a you know a thing with Matt at one point. But um so he was from there. And we had a guy who trained at our gym who worked in between Bend and and Portland. And one day uh he was there, we we're at the front desk or something, and I was there and Robert was standing there and we were talking about it, and he was like, Oh, I heard you're gonna fight Damien and and I think in his innocence, he thought that it was something that was very matter of fact and it wasn't a big deal. But he said, oh, Damien's tough, man. I don't I don't know. I don't think you can take him. <laughs> like he said that to me, like he trains at our gym. He takes my classes and he tells me he thinks I'm going to lose my next fight okay. to Damien. And Fallis looked at him and he goes, what the fuck? And then. And and then Robert said something to him like, "Yeah, that's not that's not the kind of thing you're going to be able to come to this gym and say to a guy. I, I I understand that you know him and you're friends with him too, but that's not you don't say that. It doesn't matter if you train at this gym or not. When you talk to a guy who's going to fight, you can tell all your friends that you think the guy's going to lose, but you don't say to the guy's face. You don't try to bring him down like that. That's that's fucked up. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah." I, I was still okay. I I wasn't like, oh no, now uh, you know I wasn't, de- you know, sure. Demolished. But just that that happened for that fight. I thought it was, you know, and then well, going into the fight, Damian Hatch is like a fire hydrant. Like he's short, stocky, he hits hard, and he's tough to, you know, he's tough to hurt, and he's he's got a good gas tank. So you know, and it was just, it was a fight. It was a scrap. Like me trying to to kick his ass and him hitting me back for it. You know what I mean? Him mm-hmm. trying to get inside, ducking under, throwing some loopers. Basically, uh, in the third round, it, it was it was a back and forth fight. In the third round, we were both exhausted. I was able to get on top of him, work my way to mount, and then I was just monkey punching. Like I wasn't even punching. I was just like so exhausted. I was just like, ah, ah. <laughs> you know, what I mean? just like hammer fist, trying to hit him through his guard. So exhausted, so ugly. Like I have the fight. I watched it later. So ugly. The finish was just. I was just exhausted. He was exhausted, and he couldn't defend the punches. He was just like this on the ground, and I was just like, ah. Oh. And finally, they stepped in and stopped it because he wasn't defending the punches. But you know, I was barely getting through with them anyway. It was just. It was. Okay. I, it was a TKO. I didn't knock him out cold, but he he's a tough guy and he's a good guy. He's a family man. He's got like three or four kids or something. You know, he was a little older too, like me. Yeah. And that's cool, you know, because it, <laughs> it, we've been talking about Robert and it should kind of, sh- you know, the, the incident at the desk there kind of shows, you know, that you got to play the mind game, you know, before, during and after at all times kind of thing, you know, and mm-hmm. he was there to, to cover for you. So they banned him from your gym or do they just had that inter- interchange? Just that. No, he, he kept coming. Robert was like, yeah, don't ever do that again. If you want to keep training here. Okay. And okay. then he apologized to me. I was like, it's all right, dude. It's it's good. I get it. Yeah. You know, you got to pick somebody you think it's okay. Don't worry about it, man. I mean, I appreciate it. If you wouldn't do that before a fight, if you tell me afterward that you thought the other guy was going to win, that's fine. But you know, but it was cool. He kept training there, and he's a good guy. I like him. Okay, you know what I mean? he's a good guy. And you seem like you seem <laughs> like a nice guy. Stupid. Yeah, no, 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 for sure. But you, you, you seem like a nice guy. So you didn't have that. I told you so, or like, hey, nah, I showed you. Nah. No. Okay, no, no. But he actually said, "Well, you proved me wrong." You know what I mean? He's like okay. nice. You know what I mean? I was like, "Yeah, thanks, man." <laughs> good job. Okay, good. Yeah, the nice guy in you is showing here a little bit. Now comes. Uh, the Dome of Destruction and Jerome Isaacs, which is your first five pound weight cut, as you as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, the hell that it was. Now, <laughs> um, with Lindland, with with Sonin, and you know their wrestlers up there, Couture, everybody, you've been around the weight cutting game. You kind of had to be aware. You you know you're a smart guy. You had to be aware it was a science. Mm-hmm. Um, now you decide to actually do it, so. What was so? What was 
you know, why, why was it so hard for you the first time? You know, you. Well, at the time, so first, I knew that people cut weight, but I wasn't like out cornering these guys. I would be at the fights where they would be fighting, but I wouldn't like go cut weight with them before the fight very often. That ended up happening later when you're fighting uh, at a higher level. Then, you know, more of the team is the higher level guys. They actually cut weight, even if they're not going to fight, but they'll cut weight together or they'll do something like that. So to me, I was kind of still at the beginning stages. I was starting to break into that, you know, higher level. And, you know, that's where I was like, well, I knew everybody cut weight, but I didn't know always like how much or the effect of how much you cut to how you feel. I was uh -huh. still kind of understanding that proportion. And so I thought the five pounds was kind of a big deal. And <laughs> it was at that same time, at that same dinner where Robert was like, dude, guys regularly cut 12. You know, and he said 12 to be nice. I know guys who cut 20. Yeah. Or more. So someone cut 12 yeah. the last day. Yeah, exactly. Well, the bigger you are, the more you can cut. Yeah. But still, the more muscle mass you have, the more you can cut. But like, uh, and then I, that was kind of also where I started doing weight training. I started doing like my nutrition in a way where I would gain weight. And you, you'll you notice that throughout most of my career at that time, any pictures you see of weigh-ins or whatever, I'll be kind of sucked dry a little bit, but I won't be ch cut, chiseled. Like I always had a little bit of body fat because I was growing. I was gaining weight. I was never going to really, I, I wasn't cutting so much that I had to get rid of all my body fat and everything because I was trying to still get bigger. Um, so yeah, that's kind of at that point in my career where I was like, all right, I'm going to have to start doing this you know yeah, I, and, I don't want i don't want to always be the smaller guy in the ring come fight time yeah and in your defense you know sonin and linlin and, and characters like that were probably cutting weight since they were 12 years old 10 years old exactly. you know and this was actually your first not your first time for competition this is probably one of the first times you actually cut weight in life right because you right. Didn't, uh, so for striking I, I i never really cut weight for striking even though um people do you know People do cut weight um, to to fight Muay Thai or kickboxing or whatever. I never really was one of those guys. And I never really went super far as a striker, like pro fighting striker. So I never really got so high up that I needed to cut weight for my striking either. So Okay. Now, after the Jerome Isaacs fight, there seems to be a, a little bit of a leap in competition here because the, the names start to become more recognizable to the MMA fans. Uh, you go on a run here, Brandon Melendez, Dave Garcia, Cruz Chacon, Pat Healy. Let's, mm -hmm. uh, let's take them step by step. Brandon Melendez, a veteran of over 50 fights. Yeah. Uh, what do you remember about this fight? I remember, well, oh, and here's the thing. I wasn't supposed to fight on that card. Um, Brandon Melendez had the title, the sport fight title. Okay. And I don't remember who he had beat to win it, but he he was the he's the guy who had the title. And um I wasn't supposed to fight, but the guy got hurt and it was the main event. And so Robert came up to me and Robert goes, Chris, there's an opportunity. He always framed things as opportunities. I love it, that man for it. It looks he like he beat not, Brad Blackburn. What? He, it looks oh, like he beat the, Brad Blackburn for the title. Okay, yeah. So another tough guy who I ended up fighting in the IFL and actually lost the decision to. But um, so he said, Chris, there's an opportunity. <laughs> so I think it's a tough fight. I think it's a fight that you can win, but it is a tough fight. He's very experienced. He's the, he's the belt holder right now. He won, you know, a tough fight to win the belt. Um, so there's an opportunity here for you to fight for a title in your hometown on your own show, you know, because it's Matt's it's sport mm -hmm. fight on your own show, but it's a very tough fight. I think you should do it. And you'll also be helping out Matt because you'll be saving the main event. Yeah. So and he's doing like, he's doing the Jedi mind trick. I think you should do it. You I think I should do it. <laughs> right. well, well, he didn't have to convince me that much. I saw I, I understood where he's coming from and I agreed that it was more of an opportunity for me than it was something good necessarily only for Matt or and the show. Yeah, the, the positives outweighed the negatives of short That's right. notice. And, and stuff. so I yep. took that fight and um 
man, walking into that, I was like, I had started to control my nervousness and my performance anxiety. But walking into that fight, I was like, man, butterflies, you know, I felt nervous again. I never threw up before fights or anything like that. But the anxiety got to me a little bit. Well, in that fight, this one's on YouTube. You can watch this one on YouTube. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, fighting, kind of feeling each other out. My movements are pretty telegraphed. Um, so when I moved in, kind of this telegraphed moving in, he clipped me. And I was like, and I stumbled back. And I just remember my head, it was like, so I have this ring in my head. I'm like, oh my goodness. This is the beginning of the first round. Where is this going to go? Mm -hmm. Like, I have got to get this guy. And and I could, I could, I remember thinking, why did I do that? That was so telegraphed. Like, I'm not, I'm not a broadsword kind of fighter. I'm much more of a foil, like an epe. I mm -hmm. a save, you know, I'm much more of I'm a, a die by a thousand cuts more than hacking your arm off. You know what I mean? I'm yeah, not that true. big swinging brawler. I don't punch that hard, but I hit the right spot. That's that's who I am. I use a lot of fakes, a lot of misdirection. That's kind of my style. And here I just kind of waded into this guy and he clipped me and I'm like, what am I doing? You know what I mean? Well, you know, we moved around a little bit more. I tried a couple things. Well, I, I moved in, swung out like this and threw this big overhand that connected. And I was like, oh, I cannot let him recover from this. So I went after him. I smelled blood in the water and like, I went after him, just arms flailing, and I landed. But he, like he hit me too, but it didn't hurt me bad enough to stop me. And I just I laid into him. Well, there were a couple of funny things that happened in that fight that really got the crowd going because, like, one time I threw an uppercut, but he was trying to throw a knee at the same time. So when I land, I landed the uppercut, but it wasn't a big deal. Big deal. But I landed the uppercut. He was throwing the knee. He went off balance. He fell flat on his back. Like it looked like I uppercutted him into oblivion. He fell flat on his back <laughs> and it went boom. And the crowd goes, whoa. Right. And I was a Team Quest guy, you know, who had come in, didn't nobody knew I was going to fight until like a day before, or whatever, two days before. So it was exciting. Well, and a couple other things like that happened. If you watch the fight, like, <laughs> um, he came in to throw a punch and I need him in the gut. And he goes, you know what I mean? It wasn't that bad of a knee because I didn't land with the tip of the knee. I landed kind of top of the knee with some thigh, but he was bending over to throw a punch. So it looked like I just killed him with the knee and everyone was like, Ugh. but I, I knew he wasn't, he was still recovering. You know what I, mean? I knew yeah. he wasn't, I was keeping him in a state of kind of hurt, but I wasn't hurting him worse. And I was flailing around. Finally, I kind of hunted him down against the ropes and just went cross hook and it landed and he just, Whoa. and then uh, the, the ref steps in. Fallis comes into the ring and listen, yeah, the crowd goes wild, man. That was really exciting. So yeah, that was yeah. when, that's when I won the sport fight title the first time and I defended it later. Okay, so talk to me. Did You got a belt. They put the belt on you in the, in the ring yeah. and stuff like Randy that. Randy put the belt on me. That's awesome. That's awesome. Do you still have that belt? Uh, it's in Brazil. When okay. we moved back to the United States, I there were, you know I was limited on how much stuff we could bring. I love the belts. I still have several of them. Uh, I still have several belts that I've won, but no, I left them. They're at uh, they're at my mother in law's house. Okay, okay, that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. But uh, but uh, so you're in a sport fight title uh, in the pecking order of things. Um, like I said, this is a, a, a solid show and a solid title to win. Um, now you go on and there's something called Fiesta in Las Vegas. Now you've been largely fighting in the middle, in the Northwest. You, mm -hmm. you got that one trip to Denmark. First but now, Vegas fight. Yeah. Vegas is, is also a big deal. And you get, uh, Dave Garcia who like Melendez, uh, at the time had a little bit of hype. He did, doesn't have as many fights and stuff, but he was also, um, not an easy guy. He didn't, didn't no. have a, 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 a super prolific career, but he was a name that people knew in that time. What, what, what was this fight well, like it, to you? It's funny. It's funny because, yeah, it was a first Vegas trip, but that fight, there was some things surrounding that fight that were interesting. 
training for that fight right before I went down the day before just some light moving around and stuff. I was against the wall. Linlin, he went to pull my legs out from under me, but only one leg went and the other leg stayed under me and I kind of fell on top of it and I twisted my ankle and it popped. It didn't break, but it was so sore. And I was like, was like a day or two before my fight, put ice on it immediately and just were like, Oh no. And Rob Robert's like, how bad does it hurt? And Robert was kind of testing me. He was like, is he going to use this as an excuse to get out of this fight? And I was like, we need to wrap both feet because I don't want him to know which one's hurt. And Robert's yeah. like, nice. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I ended up still fighting. And But like, then this fight's on YouTube, dude. That fight's on the internet too. And like, again, I was moving kind of slow. Both my feet were wrapped. But... I ended up in a position where um, he was a judo guy. He threw me. Mm -hmm. He threw me with like a, a scarf hold. You know, okay. and he threw me like with a head and arm. Uh -huh. And I was able to like wiggle my way to his back eventually. And I started pounding on him. And then when I went to, I think I went for an arm bar or something. And I ended up underneath, but didn't get it. Ended up underneath. And then, um, the way I the way I was holding him, I was able to trap both of his arms with one of mine so that I was able to kind of hold him in place just long enough to stick my leg through and I triangled him. Okay. Elbowed him in the triangle. He started bleeding. That that fight's also funny because the the guy who's the commentator, he was talking Dave up. He was like, Yeah, you know, Dave's such a badass, this and this and that. If you if you watch the fight on YouTube, you can listen to what the guy is saying until right when I'm getting him. And he's like, oh, he's throwing some elbows now. That looks like some fighting the elbows. <laughs> and then I won the fight. And he's like, yep. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Now, now you're putting, you've, you've taken a couple of losses, but you're also putting together some impressive stuff. At the lower levels, you had a few knockouts in the opening seconds. You also had a, a few submissions um, mm -hmm. in, in the first round. Um, you know, you you you'd gone the distance uh, only a couple of times, but that's also good for your career. And now, you know, with the step up in competition, you're still kind of ending people. This was one in the first round. Melendez was one in the first round. You you got to feel like you know, uh, and and again, the mix of not of of punches and submissions and stuff. Where you feel like you were you were putting a package together here to go to the next level. I I did, and at the same time, you know, I think like everyone, we're always plagued with some self doubt. Not everyone, but lots of people. There's some self doubt. There's some uh, you know uncertainty about how good you actually are. You know, we can. You know, I think imposter syndrome is real for fighters. Uh, you know, we we always think like, am I? Did I get lucky? Am I? You know, do I belong here? Kind of thing. Like what's going on? What's the next step? Am I going to get, am I going to get dismantled in my next fight? And everybody's going to see that I'm not that good. You know what I mean? Like you, you feel that sometimes and you fight against that. I think everyone does. And that's part of the psychological part, the mental game. That's part of uh, the, you know, conquering that performance anxiety. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I do feel like I'm growing, but I also feel like, you know, I'm, I'm not at the point where I'm like, yeah, no, Let's let's do it. I'm gonna whoop some people's ass, and we're going all the way. You know, I wasn't like that yet. Okay, okay, and that's understandable. Now, the, next up, you're in uh, King of the Cage, and you're crossing the border north to Canada. Well, this is a relatively <laughs> big show. A lot of people on there. Ryan Diaz, one of the uh, Matt Hume students, and uh, Lance Gibson students up there that um, you know was an elite little guy. Uh, ben Rothwell, who became an elite you know, heavyweight. Mm -hmm. So there was a good mix on this card. This is King of the Cage Conquest. What do you, what do you remember about this show and your Canadian experience? Well, you got the, you got that in front of you, right? Yeah. What's the date on it? Uh, December 3rd, 2005. Okay. Let me, let me, let me place this for you. December 3rd in Calgary. What do you think it was like? Yeah. I, you know, I got to live in Vancouver where Vancouver is the only place that, no. It doesn't snow in Canada at that time. <laughs> no, Vancouver, Vancouver would have been paradise at this point. Vancouver is still kind of rainy, like yeah. Seattle and Portland. Yeah. Calgary, it was so cold. It was so cold. We could barely walk outside the hotel to go next door. The vending machine didn't sell enough stuff. We wanted to go to a little store next door. 
we could barely make it from the hotel two doors down to this little <laughs> floor back. It was freezing cold. Get this. The fights, we get there. It's freezing. We're like, all right, it'll be better in the dressing room. No. Dressing room is freezing. Oh. <laughs> Trying to warm up, warm up in the freezing weather. Just we go out to the fight. It's fight time. I fought Cruz Chacon. Go out and it's freezing cold. So like I've got no shirt on. I'm sweating from the warm up. Like I feel like I'm freezing. Every breath I took, I felt this frozen air. I mean, so that that was very memorable because of that. Like it was so hard to fight up there. Just incredibly difficult to fight. It was just icy cold air. And I don't remember if there was an altitude issue too or not, but I remember that I I won the fight, but I'm not sure if I could have fought more. You know what I mean? Like it's one yeah. of those, like I am so glad this is over. <laughs> you know I, mean? I got you. And, Second and, round. And so. Nate, Nate Corey cornered me for that. So he was there and you know he said all the right things, did all the right things. He's my brother to this day. That guy, man, Nate, I owe Nate a lot. He's a good guy, man. Yeah, yeah. Nate, Nate is another one of those guys, kind of uh, you know, an unsung hero that but he had his moment at the elite, elite level as well. Mm -hmm. Um uh, a guy that uh, definitely shows the depth and quality of Team Quest that you were you were involved with, and and mm -hmm. you're one of the rising guys here. Now, you go, you come to Sport Fight again. I, I assume you're defending the belt, and you fight one of the Healy brothers. You fight Pat Healy, and these guys, you know, Pat also had his moment in the UFC, um, and uh, you know, Pat's he, had a guy he had beaten Condit, I think, already at this point, hadn't he? I, uh, I, I I'll check for you here in a second. His career's a lengthy to go through. Yeah, <laughs> but he's, uh, he's got lost fights. Yes. The, the thing about Pat Healy is, uh, Pat Healy is a guy you could put in there, and he could fight anyone in the world, and it will not be an easy night. Uh, so, yeah. what, what, and what he you proved do? that against all these tough guys he fought. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So uh, while I check here, and uh, there's the Condit fight, and do you come up afterwards or before? I think I think you were a couple of fights before the Condit fight. Mm, uh, he, he had beat okay. Carlo Prater, another. Uh, oh yeah, Carlo. Carlo's a good guy too, man. Yeah, he's another Car guy Car with a similar Car life Car experience Carlo to you with Prater. Brazil and. Yeah. yeah, Carlo Prater. I, I used to say Carlo was the opposite. He was born in the U.S. or born in Brazil, went to the U.S. I was born in the U.S., went to Brazil, kind of thing. But uh, Carlos fought on the same card. He fought Keith Wisniewski on the card where I fought in Vegas. I okay. Think. Okay. Yeah, that's um, you know, Wisniewski's another guy you'll cross paths with if I'm not mistaken here as well. Yeah. And, and Wisniewski's yeah. a, a guy. That was a tough day at the office for me. Wisniewski is a guy that fought his opening fights uh, at 16, and by 17 he was in the hook and shoot rotation. Yeah. Um. So, uh, dear, dear, dear guy to my heart, uh, one of the one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. But uh, that well, exactly well, he really is. We'll we'll get to that that fight here in a second. So here you are with uh Pat Healy. And Healy, as we says, no joke. Um, you kind of made short work of him. What, what what was your feeling at this point? What was the reaction to, to getting this win? Well, we knew how tough he was, but we also kind of knew him from the area. We'd seen him fight. And that's one of the fights where I can say that practicing a game plan and sticking to the game plan just worked exactly like we thought it was going to. Okay. Um, we, ha I had his number. I, 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 as tough as he was, it was my fight to lose. If I did the things that were going to give him the win. And by that, I mean, he could have wrestled me. He, I, my, my idea going into that fight, what we planned was you're going to do these things so that he doesn't cling to you and end up on top. And when you do do these things, you're going to cause a reaction in him that is going to help you land some good shots. What those shots will be will, are yet to be seen. But you can go through that fight. That one's available on YouTube, too. You go through that fight and you watch. I'm basically disengaging with him, striking on my way out. Um, I'm trying to turn him in the corner, attacking in the clinch so that he can't get comfortable in the clinch, so he can't do takedowns. So he, I'm forcing him to kind of keep coming into me so he can keep trying to clinch, so he can keep trying to get me onto the ground and beat me up. Well, on uh, as soon as I move forward, that's his opportunity. He doesn't have to punch his way in if I'm moving forward for him. 
And I did exactly that. I threw that kind of not even expecting them to land. I was backing up and punching, working my way out of the clinch, kind of staying on the outside. As soon as I committed to moving forward, he changed levels. And that's where that knee came up and knocked him out. Yep, yep. So definitely uh, a feather in your cap and a title defense, which is nice. A yep, lot of people, a lot of people, especially guys like like your team that uh, you, you tell me if I'm right, but uh, you're not a champion until you've defended the belt kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I felt that way too, actually. I was like, man. And uh, at the time, you had um, Pat had beat, I think it was Pat Healy had beat Eddie Ellis to fight that fight. Okay. And I had lost to Eddie Ellis. Right. And so Eddie was like, I'm going to beat Pat and I'm going to go in there and I'm going to beat you again. You know what I mean? that And and then he lost his fight to Ed, to Eddie, or he lost his fight to Pat, and then I, I knocked Pat out. And I think, you know, I we didn't really talk about it, but Ellis kind of treated me differently after that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah you, you, so, you're in which respect. Which was interesting. Yeah. A little bit. I thought I felt that. I said, I didn't, I didn't talk to Eddie after that, but like, he kind of looked, he kind of, like before, he had a win over me, and we hadn't ever trained together or anything um and, and then after that that fight with pat oh interesting also after that fight pat came and started training with us um sure and you know ryan healy also a phenomenal yeah. fighter in his own right so that's a whole nother story but yeah ryan is awesome too and they're those both of those guys are dope they're super cool yeah um but eddie he he you know before i felt like he kind of you know he's a young guy he's a little condescending um, and then after that, he was just like, oh, all right, man, you know, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and like, he just, and, and then it was just kind of cool. And I, I like Eddie to this day. He, he did come later on and came down and trained with us. And, you know, I got to train with him a little bit and it was cool. He's a good guy. Yep. Yep. No, for sure. And, you know, you again, that Northwest area was rich in talent and you know mm -hmm. it's a good place to grow up in this sport um oh oh oh, let, oh i'm sorry sorry to interrupt just an interesting thing that happened i just i just remember eddie and lisa at, in tacoma right the jerome isaac fight in tacoma this was after eddie had beat me a while back uh -huh. and i was like in line or something after my fight in line for concessions and lisa was behind me and she said something i don't remember it was a little bit snotty but she was like when when are you gonna are you, are you ever gonna try to get that fight back with eddie like are you ever gonna try to avenge that loss you know i was like you know so it was like we were young and they fighters and you know and she she i don't know why she said that to me but like later on like those kinds of things stick with you you know for better sure. or for worse but like Later on, you know, she's super cool and like Eddie's super cool and like that went away. But just way back when, like it's kind of like, like kind of try almost like kind of bullyish kind of. Yeah, yeah. I was like, why though? You know, because yeah, I was never that kind of. I didn't give her the reaction she wanted. I think. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, and the thing so. about Lisa is, you know, Lisa, you know, it's not just a wife talking smack. She was also a, a, a competitor. Yeah, and, a and good one. A good one. Yeah, for <laughs> yeah, sure. So, I know. um. You know, unfortunately for her, kind of undersized, even yeah. for the ladies. Um, yeah. So, uh, or else she could have probably gone a lot further. Now, we narrowly missed crossing paths because I was the matchmaker for uh, the Absolute Fighting Championships in Florida up until the 15th show. I did the first 15. When you showed up on the 17th to fight um, a guy named Nick Thompson at a Strasser's camp in uh, a Milwaukee guy. Uh, Nick's a lawyer now. Mm -hmm. Um and but still travels Nick, around and still travels around and trained. Yeah, Nick Nick, Nick was a guy that also uh, you know reached a, a relatively high level in yeah. the sport, and uh, you know kind of decided, eh, you know I'm going to go off and and do the uh, uh, you know the career thing rather than pursue this at some point. But he he's got like 50 fights under his belt, and this was yeah. maybe another win uh, uh, learning experience for you. He he got you in a submission. Yeah, he did. Um... That was a fight where, uh, oh, he's a, he's another big weight cutter too. Yeah, like he was huge compared to me in that fight. Yeah, but uh, that fight, I went in. Ian Loveland traveled with with me to corner. Like I didn't have. I think there were fights going on with some of the uh, more more important fighters. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So um, 
I think Foss was cornering Levin or something. I don't remember exactly what happened, but so Ian was cornering me, and that's fine. Love Ian Loveland. He was a great teammate. And sure. But you know, it was just the two of us down there. And uh I went into that fight and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna try some different stuff. And in that fight, like before, you know, it was kind of it was the AFC was kind of a bigger show, but at the same time, all the fighters and their opponents were together all the time. And, you know, we we're in the hotel, we we're doing, you know, yeah. our physicals and stuff. And so I got to talk to Nick and he's kind of a play, you know, he's playful. He's got all these cracking jokes. He's like, Hey, did you tell him we're kind of a big deal? You know, like just <laughs> kind of playing around. And, um, but we went into that fight and, you know, obviously I don't think he thought much of me. Um, he went in, he had shaved his head to look like an old man. He had like a mustache and he shaved, a um, a bald spot into his head. But yeah, I mean, I took it to him, did my best, ended up, you know, his, his weight kind of played a factor in, in like grinding me down. I landed some good shots on him, but at the same time, I was like, you know what, this is a win for me, no matter what I'm, he's a, he's got a, he's got a name. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to do my best against him. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to knock him out. Like I always, I always try to finish people. Yeah. Um, I hate decisions. They, they don't go my way as often as I'd like, but um, I, uh, you know, th at the beginning of the fight, I reached down and picked up a fake rock and threw it at him. And he bit, he was like, Whoa. And I, I flew into him with the knee. And then, uh, you know, later on, I tried a cup wear a kick. I, I landed a flying knee that he jokes with me. He still feels it in the winter. Uh, I don't know if I broke a rib or just cracked a rib, but he said, man, he, that, that hurt him for a month afterward. But yeah, he ended up uh, weighing me down and got on top. I was not able to escape. He was, better on the ground and ended up just stifling all of my attempts to get out until he finally caught a Kimura. Yeah. Yeah. He did a great he, job. He he's a, a he's a guy, he's a 25 pound cutter. He's a yeah, 25 exactly. pound cutter. Uh, you know, so for sure. And as you mentioned, your weight class, he was um, an elite weight cutter. Um, mm -hmm. Also uh, on the interesting character side, uh, I I've match made for him a bunch. He came out one way in, right. And he was wearing uh, just the, uh, the cup and, and the thing for the right. way. -ins. Oh yeah. And and yeah. he stands there for the way in. And then I'll all of a sudden he, he kind of turns around, switches poses and he's got his butt hanging out <laughs> for everybody to see. So yeah. he was definitely a character that um, liked to play, uh, you know, the funny guy, but uh, yeah, yeah. It was Some serious. When like he got in the ring. Heel. Some people are like the humor. I always appreciated that about him. I would, I much rather his approach than the heel approach. Yeah. Yeah. Now the next matchup, you get a uh, bad boy, whatever. A real veteran, Laverne Clark. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll tell you a Laverne Clark sport story. Fight again, right? Yeah. It's, this is sport fight and maybe another title defense. Laverne Clark, a veteran from the old UFC days, fought in the right. Bob Meyerowitz days. I'll tell you, he fought a match in the UFC three weeks after mowing lawns. He cut off two of his toes. Wow. And and wore shoes against Fabiano Iha. Not a good idea. Yeah. Um, but he couldn't fight without the shoes. He had to wear a size 14 and a size 11 shoe because his foot was still swollen and messed up from wow. cutting his own toes off. But he needed the money and he wasn't going to not take the fight. So wow, that's crazy. You, you got a dog that you're fighting here, even if maybe it was a little past his prime or, or mm -hmm. whatever the deal is. What's your memory mm -hmm. of Laverne Clark? Um, I didn't get to interact with him much before the fight. Um, so really my, my interaction with him was whole, like wholly at the you know, weigh-ins and then um, at, during the fight, didn't really talk to him or his team, you know, during that weigh-in thing or much before the fight. After the fight, just a hello, good job and all that. But the fight itself, I remember uh, thinking, you know, that he had clubs for hands. He, he hit real hard. And I was trying to not get hit while also, um, you know, do do my play my game, you know, hit him as much as possible, possibly get on top. We knew that uh, that I was probably going to be more technical on the ground, even though he had a lot of experience right. um, and he was a veteran. But um, he was kind of just I, I, think, based. I think I triangled him. Yeah. You got yeah. him in a, in a triangle. He was yeah. just a, a wrestler, kind of ignorant of, of submissions, even till the end yeah. of his career. Yeah, and and then that was kind of we 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 knew that if I could hurt him or if I got, and it was a fight where he's a tough guy, 
but I'm better than him on the ground, but it's hard to get him there. So it was a test. It was a test in that sense. They wanted me to fight a tough guy, but that was going to force me to get out of my, my, uh, comfort zone, my comfort zone. Yeah. And, you know, he, he was extremely oily for that fight. <laughs> yeah. No joke. I I'll say it. He was greased up. So, yeah. Veteran, yeah. veteran move kind of thing, you know, yeah. and even nobody's if it is a little cheating. That. Yep. Yep. Now, now comes another leap. Still trying with him. <laughs> yep. Yep. You got him. And in the first round. So again, you're, you're, become, you're, you're a first round. Um, is very dangerous for your opponents at this point. It's kind of proven we're, we're more than halfway through the career. Now you're taking another leap and uh, you signed with the IFL. This is the team-based league. It mm -hmm. didn't last long, but definitely they were putting together some good things and had some elite stuff going on. What, what, what are your thoughts with signing with the IFL and um, this run with the IFL where you fought all, all top guys, Brad Blackburn, Jay Herion, uh, Rory, Rory Markham, um, mm -hmm. What was your feeling on that run? I really liked my time with them. Um, I, you know, MMA is not a team sport as much right. as, you know, you, you train with a team and as much as you may even put together a team that has a fighter, each weight class, it's not, it's still not a team sport. You can have results that are better or worse based on how many of your guys win. And sure. that's kind of what they tried to do. But um, the, what, what, what I really liked about that was, you know, that there was a, there was a marketing team behind that. There was, yeah. there was a little bit of name recognition that came with it. There was uh, some travel. I met a lot of super cool people. Um, there were cool experiences going to places to fight, uh, you know, and yeah. I was grateful that I got to fight the people that I got to fight. Um, you know, yeah. I lost a decision to Blackburn. Um, I won a decision to against Huron, and I knocked Rory out. Yeah, going two and, and one under the IFL flag. And as you said, it's not a team yeah. sport. Maybe they had a little bit of, you know, issues with the concept, but they also kind of groundbreaking in that, you know, what was your team's name? Uh, we were the Wolfpack. The Wolfpack. Okay. So you guys all got uniforms. Yeah. And, yeah. and now the UFC kind of, I don't want to say they stole the idea, but they pre, pre, you know, they had the uniforms before the UFC did where now everybody's forced to wear something very similar and you get a stock, you get your clothes given to you. Mm -hmm. Um, So they also were ahead of their time in some of the thinking and some of the things that still to this day you see in the sport. So to me, it's a shame that they, they went down, because they, they made a run for it. They tried, you know. Yeah, I'm not sure, you know, at the time, especially even now, I'm not 100% uh, about, like, what the business model was and why that didn't work or if they if they overpromised and underdelivered, if they just had so much invested and weren't able to recoup it fast enough. I don't know exactly how that whole thing went down. But yeah. it was fun while it lasted, and they were, uh, there were some good wins for me especially the Markham fight at the time he was undefeated in the IFL. And uh, so yeah. it was a good, it was good. Um, now, the, uh, go the, ahead. Yeah. The, the IFL uh, it was an do interesting you, time. Do you still have the uh, Wolfpack gear somewhere or is it in your mother's house? Wolfpack, I have, <laughs> well, I have one of the jerseys and one of the pairs of shorts. Yeah. Okay, cool. And I, cool. And I keep some of the, some of the uh, memorabilia, like, you know, the uh, fight card, you know, they had the little sure. booklets that they made to give, you know, at the events to know the fighters and stuff. So I, I kept some of that just because it's nice, you know. Yo, and the thing, again, they were they were doing big level stuff and maybe, you know, it's hard they to sustain. Some good names with, fighting too. Yeah, yeah and, and hard to sustain maybe, you know, if you don't have the money coming in and that might be part of it too. But they did things like, for example, I, I, I believe – uh you know, you probably sign posters for him, sat in a room yeah. with them handing you, and you had yeah. to sign 30 posters and stuff like yeah. that, you know, that they were giving out and things like that. So, um, yeah, definitely it, was, they, it wasn't posters. It was the booklets, the things like that. It was other material. Yeah, it wasn't as post posters. As okay. So, yeah, but they, they had a good concept. Now, uh, my attempt at going big time also didn't last long, but next up for you was Ray Steinbeis in Vancouver for Bodog Fight. Right. And, uh, you know, another thing that... I ran into that, that maybe the IFL ran into is that the UFC at this point was a big machine. Yeah. Um, you know, we were going to do our second pay-per-view and I, I, I don't know if this is 
just rumor or true or anything like that. I, I don't care anymore, right? But um, we're doing our second pay-per-view, and we've done our first one. We're calling the executives to try to get the same people we spoke to for the first one, and we're not getting callbacks. And we're like, what is this? What is this? Goes to find out that the, the lobby. That, that that person had been hired by the UFC now, that they were yeah. a UFC employee and not working at the pay-per-view company anymore. Yeah. So, you know, they, they played the game. They were playing well, three-dimensional I mean, chess. The, the UFC, <laughs> you know, the UFC, there's a reason why right now you're seeing in the news that they're they're considering, you know, a settlement with all these lawsuits and the, the monopoly and the monopoly. Um, uh, the UFC plays dirty. They, they've set up the sport um there's a lot of conflict of interest there's a lot there are there's a lot going on in the sport that it's it's the structure is is flawed right now in our sport and uh in great part because of the ufc um so yeah. it's just it's too bad and you know there's there's a fight going on right now to change that um yeah we'll see we'll see how it goes several, I... on several on several different fronts but yes yeah. you know i think i think it would be a good start it, I think it's fundamental to get the Ali Act passed for MMA. That's the first thing. And the other is we need to change the conflict of interest in the 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 UFC, the promoter being uh, in control of everything and being the decision maker uh, yeah. for everything. Yeah, especially when um... – you know they're they're not experts at neutrality either. You know, so oh, no. <laughs> um, that's a very euphemistic way of saying that. I appreciate. I appreciate. Uh, it. Let, let's talk about the Bodog fight. <laughs> hey, you know, um, they do some things well, but neutrality isn't one of yeah. them. I mentioned it earlier that that idea of you can make the fight, you could even want a guy to win. You better that you not show it, and as a company, you got to be able to react either way. You can't slant it towards one guy. So. Well, even, yeah, but you can't. You you also can't fabricate rankings. You also can't yeah. have exclusive contracts and force people to fight only for your title, and then have you know rankings yeah. that don't mean anything. You you fabricate belts. There, there's just so much to it. You control. You know, you your you, your books are closed. You know, fighters can't. Um, they can't negotiate based on their worth. Um, they're not, you know. Yeah. It's it's yeah. it's whatever it's whatever the UFC wants when they want it, how they want it. You know, it's complicated. It's uh. Yeah. No, for sure. You you saw it with yourself the, later. The UFC. The UFC um, creates a product. They they pay the seller, but they tell the seller that you you can only sell to certain people, and they tell you how much you can you can charge. Yeah. It's like wait a second. You can't. You can't create the price. You can't create. You can't create. Uh, you can't control the the consumer and con control the product. Control everything. You can't. You can't be everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No. I think. I think. Uh, I mean, it, it becomes a legal issue. Summer. It becomes UFC, a legal issue. It is know? a legal issue, and that's being fought in the courts right now. But yep. like the UFC, have you seen their UFC three hundred poster? Uh, I haven't seen the poster yet, no. That's because there isn't one. It's just UFC 300 in a gold plaque looking thing. It says UFC 300. They're yeah. promoting the UFC. They're not promoting fighters. They want they want you excited about UFC independent of what product they give you. Independent right. of what fights it's going to be. Anyway, we go on forever about that, but yeah. Sure. sure. I, I'll, I'll add one little thing to that as a caveat for you. It's like um, the main event, I think they added a main event with Pereira now, but the main event for a long time was uh, the two Chinese girls fighting for the, the title. And th people were kind of disappointed. It's not a great fight for the American market. But right. in the Chinese market, I have no doubt that they're monetizing that like crazy. Yeah. And th that's all they care about. You know, mm -hmm. so why did they didn't right. bother much with the rest of the card? Because they're already going to make, you know, the first all Chinese world title fight. And, you know, they support their women athletes like their men athletes over there. And you're talking about a market of if they could get, you know, a fifth or sixth of the country, it's like the entire U.S. watching them. So right. it's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, now, with Steinbeis, you're in Bodog, you're in Vancouver. Steinbeis, a tough guy from a fighting family. His brother also made a UFC run yeah. uh, and things like that. Uh, what do you remember about Ray Ray and Steinbeis and the Bodog experience? The, uh, it was a good experience. It was novel for me. I got to go up to Vancouver, which I've been to before, but I like Vancouver a lot. 
-hmm. And, uh, you know, I thought that the accommodations, everything was real top notch. Um, you know, I mean, if, if the owner of the thing, you know, flies to Paris to buy a pair of $10,000 shoes, then you can expect that he's probably not going to spare expense on your hotel, which he did not. Uh, it was nice. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was, it was yeah. a nice experience. Everything was taken care of. It was a two day event. The one that I went to, I think I fought the second day, but it was a yeah. two day event. Um, on the Indian reservation of, yeah a lot of cool oh yeah a lot of cool people uh met a lot of great fighters i knew a lot of the people obviously um especially with my connection with brazil uh it's it was funny after that fight though like ray was a nice guy and it was a good fight i felt i performed well that's one of the reasons i'm so uh i'm so salty about not having that fight in my library because i think it was a good fight for me it was a good showing you know it would have yeah. been a good fight for me to be able to say, hey, you know, this is kind of the style of fight that I like to do. But anyway, uh, Ray was a nice guy, um, honorable and, you know, uh, humble yeah. in defeat and in, in victory. And I won that fight, though. And after the fight, I was talking to Marcus Pahumpia. I don't know if you know. Sure. Yeah. Sure. ATT's Marcus coach. Pahumpia. And I was like, man, but if I, uh, you know, in, in Portuguese, if, if I had done this or if I had done that or what if when I did this, he had done that. And you know, because I was asking him yeah, that move, I think I could have done it a little better like this. And he's like, well, you could have done this, this, and that. And I was like, yeah, but what if he had done this? What if he had done that? And he's like, if, if, if he hadn't got fucked up, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so like, si, 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 si ele tivesse feito isso, si ele tivesse feito isso, ah, si, 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 fudeu. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's yeah, no, for up. sure. You can always say what if, but. Yeah, those exchanges and yeah. in, in, in with Parampina, an elite guy also. So, you know, yeah. definitely you're talking, uh, you know, you're talking shop with the best guys around. Right, so right. That's good I was stuff. talking about jujitsu with him. And that's funny because he fought Hobino a couple of times. Yeah, and I, I know he fought Hoyle Gracie too, you know. So, yeah, yeah. yeah you're talking about an elite He's guy. Yeah. He uh he had a bad Abu Dhabi experience. Um, he, he, he didn't like wrestlers because he liked top game. And, uh, he got his opponent switch from Joey Gilbert, who was an elite wrestler, yeah, um, to an unknown guy named Uriah Faber. <laughs> yeah. So some guy, yeah. yeah so it, 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 he he was one and done there, but I know he had a lot more to show. Um, mm -hmm. Moving on, real quick here, you, you, then you get another one of our veteran guys, a guy who had done the bow dog thing. He, he took a a loss to Eddie Alvarez, but was actually pretty good on the bow dog rankings. Is a guy named Derek Noble uh, out of mm -hmm. the Midwest. Um, uh, what, what do you remember about Noble also in sports fight, the homecoming? Um, I remember that I, I remember thinking, you know, he, this is a good guy. Like he's not a world beater, but he's a tough opponent. And he's, you know, if I mess up, I'm, he'll clock me. But, um, I felt really comfortable in that fight. Actually. I felt that I controlled the fight really well. At some points he was just covering up. There's a picture sequence, sequence, sequence of me kind of being on his back and he's turtled up covering and i'm just going like this and i look at the ref and i'm like like are you are you gonna stop this like he's not you know what i mean mm -hmm. i hit him with some good shots i wasn't really in trouble at all in that fight i think he underperformed but i think i performed well but i think Derek underperformed i don't know uh you know i don't know if his heart was in it i don't know i don't know yeah. but it was a good fight for me to win and yeah for it sure up, you know, it was a decision i think but i think it should have yeah. been stopped because I was kind of beating on him a little bit. Yeah. Now with your IFL run, you, you had the Steinbeis win, which was a good win on a high level mm -hmm. show. And now mm -hmm. Noble, you have a four fight winning streak and that puts you in the UFC. Uh, what was kind that of, like yeah. the, the uh, negotiations, the contract, everything going into the UFC? Cause you got John mm -hmm. Fitch at first and, and you know, uh, the tough first UFC fight. And the reason sure. that happened, well, uh, John was, he was, Slated to fight Akihiro Gono. Okay. But Gono broke his hand again. He rebroke his hand and they needed a replacement. And that was an opportunity. Again, I was on vacation. I had just gotten off of the bus that was taking me from the airport to my hotel in Hawaii, in Honolulu. And he called me as I was getting off of the hotel, the airport shuttle. And he said, Hey, I got this opportunity. Gono broke his hand. They need an opponent for Fitch. I was like, was John it Follis who called you or was it yeah, uh, Joe Silva's director? Okay. It's okay. 
They needed an opponent for Fitch. And I was like, wow, you know, that's a step up from step ups. And, yeah. you know, it shook me for a second. And I was like, and at that time I wasn't like, yeah, let's do it. I was like, what do you think? Yeah, I wanted to, I wanted his honest opinion. I was like, really? I mean, because Fitch at the time, Fitch wasn't just in the UFC. He was the number one contender. And he actually went on to fight George St. Pierre on the next card after he he won the fight against me. I lost the decision, which still garnered me quite a bit of respect. But yeah, I fought Steve Bruno on the card where he fought Fitch. Um, yeah. But that fight, like as soon as you know, I talked to Fallis and I accepted that fight, then it was on. I had a week of vacation in Hawaii that got ruined. My wife, all her pictures with our son, she's alone on the beach because I'm out running or trying to find a gym to work out at. So we were there for a week. And then when we got back, I was like, look, this is the biggest fight of my life so far. And it really was. Sure? And I needed to figure out what to do. And, you know, I got with Fallis and Fallis actually talked to Danny. I ended up going down and training with Danny in Big Bear because that card was where he fought Anderson Silva. Yeah, you told so, Danny Henderson. Yeah, 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 sorry, Dan Henderson. Um, so I went down and trained with Dan at his camp. I was just kind of, he just, he let me come in and participate in his training camp that he had already set up. And he just let me kind of, you know, he did that for me. He helped me like that. Um, and that's how you could tell Chris had gotten to the elite because I don't think uh, I would get away with calling Dan Henderson Danny. <laughs> <laughs> we all did, though. I mean, <laughs> Dude, Dan is the most down to earth. He's he's just he's that's he's that guy. He yeah. really is. He's that guy. He'll take his teeth out and he'll laugh and you know because he's yeah. got you know. I, I've been around him and I I love him and respect him. Um, I think you know arguably a, a top ten all time guy. Even oh, if, me, oh, if he didn't win a UFC title, for but, sure, for sure. Um, but for but, sure, um, yeah. Anyway, so I trained at Big Bear and I ended up spending. I was going to go down for two weeks, ended up staying two and a half or three or something for the full time uh, and went to the fights from there. All righty. So, uh, so Fitch, obviously a big fight. Fitch, was that in the pay-per-view? Were you on the pay-per-view there? Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that whole thing that we talked about with uh, Hawaii, that was one of, that was also one of the motivating factors, you know, not only because it was a, a, a you know, opportunity to get into the UFC to fight a big name like Fitch, who was number one at the time, but also because it was the first fight on the pay-per-view on okay. UFC 82. 82. Yep. 82. Yeah. So now obviously the UFC at least did the right thing. You know, you did them the short notice fight. You put on a fight. You took Fitch all the way to a decision. Mm -hmm. um, they bring you back to fight Steve Bruno, a guy who may have been training with Parumpinha, who we mentioned here. Um, uh, yeah, he was an American top team guy and he had just won the title over in the spirit FC in Korea. Okay. okay. So that's why he, that's why he got his opportunity. Yeah, he got he, his opportunity because he won the spirit FC over in Korea. And then I got an opportunity because they needed somebody uh last minute replacement. And I had, you know, I had a, a, some decent wins. So they were like, oh, well, you know, let's give this guy a chance. And, you know, we, my management knew people in the UFC. So there is a little bit of that, you know, of who you know. So. Yep, yep. And Bruno, <clears throat> a ATT doesn't help, you know, I mean, doesn't hurt. Uh, but right. uh, you, you score a win in a decision. Now, how did that feel? This was not on the pay-per-view or did you get that on the pay-per-view? No, it wasn't. No, I only had the one on pay-per-view. But, you know, I felt in the fight. I, I I pretty much I dominated Steve Bruno completely. I mean that fight. If you are if you have fights UFC fights that you can watch somehow, mm -hmm. um, he I was not in danger at any point. And after the fight, even though I won, I remember Joe Silva said, "You know, you should have finished that guy." And I was like, "Damn!" You know, even Robert and I both were like, "Well, perhaps." You know, perhaps yeah. that's true, but at the same time, like he was like in the middle of the fight. I don't know if you can hear it when the fight is going on on the UFC broadcast, but we all heard it. His coach was saying, was yelling, do not let him finish you. Uh -huh. Like his whole game, like at one point he had, he was on all fours 
and he knew I couldn't kick him in the head. So I had to get close to punch him. And as I tried to get close to punch him, he would like swing his arms out to try to grab my leg. Like he was doing in Portuguese, we call it It's the anti game. Mm -hmm. He was doing, he was fighting to not lose. He was fighting. He wasn't fighting to win. Yeah, and I mean, uh, it was it was crazy. Like he did, like I hit him with big shots. Like I have so many highlight shot. Like you know, you yeah. know, when you get clips of fights, I knocked him down several times. Yeah, it's, it's just, one of those things where Joe Joe Silva, you know, no doubt, obviously been around the sport, knows, you know, uh, encyclopedias about the stuff. But mm -hmm. you know, five foot two hundred ten pounds, it's easy. You know, easier said. For him to say, you know what I mean? It's like he yeah. wasn't in there. Well, yeah, and also he that he also said that in a way because of how the fight transpired. He didn't bring Steve Bruno in there as a guy for me to kill. He brought Steve Bruno in there because he thought, you know, this guy, that guy, Chris did better against Fish than we thought, and now, yeah, you know, this guy, he needs an opportunity. Let's see where Chris is at. So after he saw how that fight went. At the end, when I didn't finish Bruno, he's like, you should have finished that guy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's just, eh. and I made some mistakes too. I'm not going to say I didn't. Maybe I had some opportunities that I let up or I didn't. Like there was a point even Joe, Joe Rogan, he was like, oh, he's going to his back here. And then I changed position. I kind of let Steve off the hook for a back position because I wanted to be comfortable. And I knew that he was just trying to survive. So I didn't want to waste the energy and the time. I wanted to try to finish him with punches. And Joe on the broadcast, he was like, I, well, I don't, I'm not sure why he did that. You know okay. I mean? like, okay. Well, you know, I, maybe I should have stuck glued to him there on the side and kind of tried to advance to a rear naked. I don't know. But, no, it's okay. You know, you were comfortable in the fight. Maybe you were overthinking yeah. a little bit, uh, maybe. you know, but, but uh, also, yeah. Yeah, but, maybe. But you got something, you know, rare. Um, we got a lot of athletes in this game, and not a lot can say they got a W in the UFC. Um, uh, so that, that's your W. You now you come back, mm -hmm. you you face uh, John Howard. John Howard, yep. And uh, uh, you, this will be your third decision in a row. And uh, we talked about prior split decisions. This one didn't go your way as a split Did decision. Uh, St. Pierre me. versus Penn two, a big show. Mm -hmm. Um. What, what do you think? Do you think you beat John Howard? Mm, I thought it was close enough to get the decision. The, the The reason, especially that I thought that I thought they should have considered the fact that I, at one and a half minutes of the first round, he head butted me and he blew my nose up. Just he busted my nose, broke it. I couldn't breathe. So a minute and a half into the fight, he's hopping around. He's still energized. I'm swallowing blood, trying to breathe. Um, I don't remember if it was Herb Dean, but Herb Dean didn't notice it. So I didn't even get a break, but my nose was exploded. And was you he, know what I mean? Yeah. So I fought the whole fight like that. And, uh, you know, it's hard to say it didn't affect me. It, of course it did. I still, I think I still put on a pretty good fight. I, I heard him several times. He had a few moments too. He tried a half slicer on me, which honestly I was impressed by most guys don't go for calf slicers in high stakes like that. And he got close. And uh, I even remember I heard Joe say, hey, whoa, that, that's a move. He's that That is a, a legitimate attempt. And I was like, yeah, but I, I know how to get out of it. But yeah, I was surprised he went for it, you know. So, I mean, and John's a super humble guy, super good guy. But it just it, it sucked that, you know, a minute and a half into the fight, I got a head butted he went in for a an overhand and i came in to try to punch like a the thunder and he just you know i i wish i wish they had considered that we won fight of the night i got a bonus for it you know i mean it was okay. a good fight yeah. okay good good it and was a good fight i just thought i thought i did enough to win and especially they should have maybe considered that i didn't even get a a bit of a recovery for that head butt but you know it is what it is i'm not i can't cry about it now <laughs> yeah no no for sure uh, you know always a gentleman kind of thing you are but uh you know split decisions in the ufc you always kind of got to wonder um you know because you were close and and sometimes that defines you now you, you get a, a return fight against mike pile who pile is, is a guy that 
I think that was maybe also early in his UFC career, but he turned it into a long UFC run of several you know years and, and more than a dozen fights. Um, How did you feel about the Mike Pyle fight? What went on in that one? Um, well, I, you know, it's funny because Mike, I actually knew Mike for quite a while before we fought. Mike's a funny guy. He's a nice guy. Um, super skilled on the ground. Um, I was actually surprised he stood with me as much as he did. He did a good job of weighing on me in the clinch and being heavy. Um, you know, trying to tire me out. I had some trouble breathing. I had some respiratory issues, but you know what I mean? It's like if what I don't like about talking about fights sometimes is that like, I don't make excuses for my losses. I'll say, Hey, you know, this guy beat me. Um, you know, like the cam fight, the Eddie fight, the, these are legitimate losses. I lost these fights and that happens. Um, I just didn't have a great run when I, when I made it to the UFC, when I had these fights, you know, I had a short fight against the top guy, I got my face broken in with the head, butt. I, you know what I mean? I was going through some health issues when I was fighting. It's like, do you pull out of fights that are that caliber? So are you the guy who pulled out or are you the guy that fought with some issues? Like, so I kind of always was the guy who I wasn't about really going to pull out of fights. Like the thing that happened with my ankle with Dave Garcia, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So if I had lost that fight in Vegas against Dave Garcia and I had told you about the ankle thing, you'd be like, ah, excuse, ankle thing. You know what I mean? Right. So it's like if if you win the fight and you had a thing, then people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, he, you know, he had a thing, but yeah, he won the fight. You know what I mean? But if I lost the fight and I have a thing, then it's like, oh, he's making excuses. So it, it's a tough, it's a tough gig sometimes, yeah. you know, to tell people the reality of what was going on. Like, for example, uh, in Rio, we got uh, we got held up like this was in the media, like because I got interviewed about it. It was true. Um, we got uh, we got robbed in Rio. I had been living in Rio for three months. You know, we just come back to Brazil. We moved to Rio. I was with Team Nogueira. Three months after we moved there, I was robbed at gunpoint. They cleaned out my house, took me and my car with all my stuff in the car. Uh, had to lock my family in the that's a long story it's actually pretty interesting but we're not getting into it <laughs> uh, okay but, yeah, i don't want you to relive you know, it here. no way it's, no no i don't mind reliving it it's just it really is like depending on how deep you delve into it it's kind of you know because there are all the things all the chances you thought you might have had should you have done things differently you know what i mean there's yeah something. yeah no that's that's yeah it's definitely baggage every every fighter you know, walks into the ring with some of that, and the exactly. less, the Everybody more, has a thing, yeah. and the more you can avoid it, the you know, the more your top side becomes. Mm -hmm. But it, it's unavoidable unless things are going perfect, and you know, yeah. that's heavy baggage. You know, the, the, I I've heard guys, you know, uh, l lost his mother and fought the next day because you know, as a tribute to her. A lot of people would internalize mm -hmm. differently, you know, mm -hmm. but it had to be baggage in the fight, you know, either mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, unbelievable, unbelievable stories there. Now, the the sad part of it is that that was your last UFC fight, and and it, it's like, do you feel like they didn't give you enough of a chance because you got a few decisions, no. No, uh, you know, I, all I, the way. I, I, you know, if I'm being honest, I think uh, I would have liked more opportunities. It just it some things happened that they didn't go my way in that sense, like. Uh, either in terms of things that were going on outside of training. Um, but, you know, I went in and with those losses, I can, I can understand the decision to cut me. I'm not, you know, I'm not sour about it. Uh, I just, I wish I had been afforded the opportunity to show more. Uh, just like the reason they chose me to give me an opportunity because of some wins that I had, because of how I performed in those wins, you know, Perhaps, you know, I could have shown that I can perform better in, in different circumstances, but yeah, it is what it is. And then, you know, the, you're training, I have a family, you know, and so sure. it's like, yeah, responsibilities point, at, and stuff. Yeah. At that point, you know, getting cut at that point, I was still fighting. Obviously I still had fights after that, but then it became an issue of, you know, what, what am I going to do with this? And then yeah. that's when kind of life starts happening. And then you're like, all right, now I got to juggle more stuff, more kids, uh, you know, 
some work maybe outside of fighting because I'm not living just from purses. Now I own a gym and I teach classes too, because that's, what's going to pay bills, not yeah. fighting. You know what I mean? So sure. there's all these things going on and life changes and that's normal. But yeah, I wish perhaps I would have had more opportunities. Of course. How, how did the, uh, the cut call come? They, they, they call Follis or did you get the call or what, no, they, what was your they, memory I always did everything. I always did everything through management. Okay. Um, I mean, I knew Joe, I knew Joe Silva and I knew, I knew, I knew everybody, everybody knows everybody, but, um, and I even spoke to Joe on several occasions, but no, yeah, yeah, it was, I, I, I actually preferred that. I preferred yeah. going through management. How did he break it to you? Uh, well, after that loss, um, it, it, we kind of imagined that it might happen. So it wasn't a big surprise. He was just like, okay. Hey, Chris, bad news. I'm sorry, man. But yeah, they, the call came through. I just talked to Silva. He said, yeah, he said, you cut. I was like, okay. you got it. That's okay. In, no, I mean, in, it, yep. just, it is what it is. Well, that's a, you know, it's kind of a, I, I see it as a very professional way of taking it and doing it, you know, on your, you, 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 you thought it might happen. You'd already prepared for it. That's part of the benefits of, of, of the staff and the group that you were with. Mm -hmm. um, now you came back, you fought was Newski, who was another guy who had put in, the mileage and, you know, did you have the dream of, okay, now I, I'm working my, in the immediate aftermath. Now I, I got to work my way back to the UFC. Was that the first thought in the fights uh, in the immediate future or were you already considering uh, the, the rest of your life? No, I was, I was still, I was still imagining that if I got some good wins that I could work my way back despite being perhaps a little older than a lot of the guys, but one thing that was funny about the fight with Wisniewski, um, I don't know if I heard it in an interview or for someone told me, I think it was in an interview, like a pre-fight interview. Uh, he was like, I hope he's not taking me lightly. You know, Keith said that. He was like, I hope he's not taking me lightly. And I just remember thinking, you know, everybody else might think that. I'm surprised he thinks that. Like, I would never take Keith lightly. Never. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I fight, bro. I know who you are. I'm not taking you lightly. You know, I'm coming from Brazil to fight you. I'm not taking you lightly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, so, but you know, in that way, at that point, I had gone, I was in Brazil, obviously. And uh it was actually my jujitsu coach who came up and cornered me. At that point, I had already moved out of Rio. I had moved away from Rio and back into my hometown. But unfortunately, in my hometown, there was not a lot of training. Um, you know, most of my training, I was doing jujitsu. I was doing little gloves with jujitsu guys. Um, and it wasn't the same pressure as fights. You know, it was just, it was hard to prepare for a fight against a guy like Keith. And also, I made a lot of mistakes. I was, I cooled off after, I, I don't remember the amount of time between those fights. But it was a while, I think. I think it was a okay. Yeah, you September to April, so it's about seven, eight months. Eight months, yeah. So I wasn't fighting, and I wasn't really training hard with hardcore MMA guys. You know, I, I didn't have an MMA team where I was involved in it the whole time. So especially after after uh, you know, Team Quest, you must have felt the drop off. I guess. Well, 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 Team Quest from Team Quest, I went, I went from Team Quest to team Nogueira because I moved to Rio. Right. So, okay. You know, I had my, it's just, that's the way life is. Sometimes I'm, I, I, when I got into UFC, I ended up moving back to Brazil during my UFC contract. It was, it was, you know, life yeah. happens. So, um, yeah, in that, in that sense, that Keith was fight and it, God, what a great guy. I mean, you know, he just, he was able to keep pressure on me. And then eventually when he was on top, I'd flip over and then he was on my back. He couldn't finish me. And, but, you know, I would try to get out. I would flip back over. I'd, you know, get guard back. And then he'd be on top trying to do something. And then I try to get up. He'd tackle me and get on my back again. I'd flip back over. So it was like, I, I got wrestle fucked a little bit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I wasn't I wasn't able to 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 use jujitsu as effectively as I wished I could have, and uh, there was hardly any striking. He just glued to me on against the cage, which is he which he does. You yeah. know, he he just he fought a great fight, and uh, 
and I was I wasn't up to snuff. So, so you know, it's a tough tough loss to swallow. But he did a great job. He won the fight. I, you know, I didn't I didn't lay down for him. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, no, no, no. And, and it was news keys just Yeah, he invited know. me to he, he invited me out to drink uh copious amounts of Jaeger or of, of uh Irish car bombs afterwards. I was like, Yeah, thanks, brother, but I'm not in the mood. <laughs> <laughs> I came all the way from Brazil to get, you know, to get smothered in my fight. Ah. Yeah, no, that's okay. I, I, I know Keith real well. I, I, mm-hmm. I actually got to take him to, to Russia and uh yeah, he's a smart, uh, similar yeah, to yourself, a, a smart, uh, you know, professional guy. He, mm-hmm. I, after the fight, you know, he just got on the subway and um, uh, I think we were in Moscow that time. Um, got on the subway and just goes, I'm going exploring, man. I'm never going to be here again kind of thing. So right. um, just an impressive guy and, and uh, a guy that uh, is underestimated. We did a long interview with him as well. Um, uh, on the podcast. So yeah, people can look that. that up now. You said you'd move back to Brazil. You did now uh, end your career with a couple of fights or a handful of fights in Brazil. Mm-hmm. And uh, what did that feel like? Did that feel like you're coming well, down I, to smaller stuff or were you well, still yeah, dreaming? I was, but I was, but you know, I was in that situation. I, I, I placed myself in that situation, but it was for my family. It was for quality of life. You know, Rio, definitely not for me. Um, nice place to visit. Would never live there again. Um, but so I'm, I'm in my hometown, it's a, you know, 700,000 people and not a lot of high level elite training. There are lots of fighters there, good fighters, but they're not like that level. And, you know, and I, I got a lot, I, I made tons of lifelong friends in that city and of fighters even, but they just never they never got as far, maybe because they didn't know the right people, maybe because they didn't get the right fights, maybe, you know, but lots of them were very talented, but, um, it became difficult to train the way I needed to train to continue winning the kind of fights that I needed to win. Um, so like, for example, I don't remember at what point it came, but I fought Leandro Silva, Buscapé was his name. And after my decision lost to him, he got into the UFC. So then I became kind of this gatekeeper, this ex UFC guy. If you beat me, then you'll get a chance. And you know, that's kind of what it became, which is too bad. Uh, I thought I won that fight against him. I didn't like the decision. There was a little home cook in there. Maybe, you know, okay. he was, you know, going to beat the, going to be, if you do enough to not lose, then we're going to give you the fight type of thing. Like, I don't know if you want, I don't have that fight on video, but, I've watched clips of people who recorded it on their phones. Yeah, I don't know. I thought I watched that. I thought I I won it, but it is okay. what it is. Now, and then he I, got into UFC afterwards. Yeah, and and you know, um, at that point you're kind of getting near the end. You fought one more time. How did you know it was time for you to hang it up? Because you were still, you probably still, you you you've said throughout that you started this a little older and stuff. But you probably, um. Physically, could it still gone on? It seems like maybe it was more uh, the writing on the wall that was getting to you. Well, well, how do you sum that up? Well, my last fight was a fight in Shuto, and I fought uh, this Valmir. Kid. Yeah, Valmir Bidu. He was was his his nickname was Bidu. Decent fighter. Also got into the UFC after that. <laughs> um, but I, I I started feeling like I couldn't get the training that I needed. And I had so many other things that were going on that I needed to, that were more important, right? My, okay. I had done, I had maybe done what I needed to do as a fighter. I could still live from martial arts. I could still be involved. And I have been involved and trained a lot of other guys who, you know, I've cornered lots of guys. I've, I've trained guys to a high level of the sport. So it's, I feel like I was still able to be involved in the sport and I owned a gym in Brazil in that very same city um, that did well. But, you know, as a fighter, I was like, yeah, I mean, I could keep, I would have to change a lot of things and then go back to making all of these, excuse me, go back to making all of these sacrifices and forcing my family to go through these sacrifices. And now, then I had two kids and then later I had three, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. 
at some point I've got to say, you know, yeah. And I know that there are people who go into their forties and they're still fighting, but I don't think that's the norm. You know what yeah. I mean? Especially for the, like, you know, if you're not, heavyweights tend to maybe extend their career into their forties a little more than smaller guys. I think it just seems to be the case. Well, um, like, I mean, but even, I mean, even Dan, even Dan, you know, Dan fought. I mean, he, I don't remember when his last fight was, but he was fighting at a high level, mid levels, you know, 40, 40, 44. 40, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, but I mean, it kind of depends where you are in the sport, who you're fighting and, you know, how much you've been able to do before that shit randy started the sport when he was 26 or something yeah. he became champion for the first time i think he was 30 35 i don't remember no he started when he was 20 how old was it how'd that go I, I i know even in one of his ufc fights i think after he, he beat vitor he said i'm a late bloomer <laughs> the, sport, <laughs> the sport was different the sport was in its infancy and he was an elite wrestler already you know yeah. it's just different yeah, but, I, yeah I, I i actually attended randy's debut <laughs> so um yeah much respect so uh, i respect you know what you're saying we were obviously again here towards the end of the interview where it's come across that you know you you got a head on your shoulders i think it's a good decision especially you know when you're judging your life and stuff that you don't go out you, you finish with an 18 and 10 record a lot of guys string together and they start to lose at the end and you know wind up good fighters with a 500 record and stuff. At least you didn't put yourself through that. How were the yeah, injuries, the, the, the head, yeah. uh, you know, you, did you, no injuries, one emerges unscathed, but. Injuries were not a factor in my decision to not continue competing. Um, I've had injuries. Honestly, I've hurt myself a lot more outside of the sport than in the sport, if I'm being honest. Okay. Um, but the th the thing for me was, you know, I was lucky enough to have options, you know, some fighters that they fight and then when they're done fighting, they're done and they can't do anything else. You know, I, uh, I worked in food and beverage for a long time. And then I also got a degree. I taught English for 15, 20 years, you know, on and off at different points. Um, so, uh, you know, my nickname was the professor, right? So, you know, some, you talk to some guy, no, I was going to go to the thing and then, this guy tried to punch me, you know, yeah. you know, fighters aren't generally thought of as being highly, you know, uh, yeah. arti articulate people sometimes. And, you know, which sucks, but I had options, which is nice. And then, you know, so I kind of pursued that. I went into, you know, just kind of focused on the gym and teaching and then administrative at the school and curriculum development and things like that. You know, now I work in, I'm back in food and beverage working with uh, restaurants and management and stuff like that. So, well, it's a good thing. You're not one of those guys that you kind of got to worry about in his old age. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, well, you always do. Cause the economy is such that <laughs> it's like, if you're not a multimillionaire, you're going to have to either move somewhere where your money stretches or you're going to have to become a multimillionaire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now let me ask you as we wrap up, like I said, we're trying to wrap up, but, uh, did you ever get concussions or brain, you know, traumas or anything like that from the sport that, that you felt? No. Okay. I, I was lucky enough that, well, I mean, brain cells have been killed. Let's yeah. uh, brain, 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 brain cells have been lost, but um, I don't feel like I've taken it like lots of other people have. And especially cause you know, MMA is, luckily it's a sport that's not causing cte as much as boxing for example boxing yeah. you're measuring punches in the hundreds to the body and head in in mma yeah there's smaller gloves but you, there's there's knees there's uh you know leg kicks there's lots of time spent in the clinch and on the ground some with punching some without lots of so you're not getting punched nearly as much in mma you're not getting concussed to the head nearly as often or as as much as as with boxing for example mm -hmm. but um it, i don't feel like i have those kinds of injuries now okay. now team quest had a reputation for being a uh a real rugged room when they trained but yeah, they it, 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 probably smart too because if you avoided it there you, you know not to talk about other people's stuff but keith was newski now keith a smart kid, like I said, you know, wanted to explore when we traveled, Um, re, you know, was reading Ayn Rand and, and stuff like that while, you know, on the road and doing stuff like that. And he still 
to this day, he, he's got his job. He's an iron worker. And, um, you know, I think he's in Italy right now traveling with his family. Um, oh, cool. So, um, but I've had him come up to me after a fight and ask me four or five times how I won. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? So that happened to me one time. That happened to me one time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. okay. Well, if, if that, yeah, I guess, mm, I guess that could be considered at least a semi confession, but yeah. Let's that close with that story time. for you so that you can go to your family. That was, that was my fight with Jay Huron. Um, and in fact, that's a funny story because uh, he was, that was in the IFL and he was with the, um, not the Pitbulls. That was, uh, that was Hens Hens team. Anacondas. Okay. Boss, boss yep. Reading's team. Yep. And, and I fought him and that fight, that show, I believe was in Portland or Olympia. It was, it was, it was in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. And it was a close fight. Um, like, and I, I think the first fight was close. The first round was close. In the second fight, uh, Jay not got a knockdown towards the end of the round. And he rang my bell. Like, I felt it. He rang my bell. I wasn't out. Like, I wasn't asleep, but I was on the ground. And I was like, okay, is he going to come in? I was, you know, I was fuzzy, blurry vision. I was like, I got to stay with it here. And the bell rang. So I kind of got saved by the bell there. Okay. You know what I mean? And then, uh, but in the third round, um, I came out, landed some good punches. I got a knockdown on him that he thought he said that was a slip, but I, it was, a, it was a punch and nothing tripped him. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so it was, it was a knockdown. And then uh, right towards the end of the round, he tried to take me down from the clinch and I reversed him and I threw him on the ground. And anyway, I got a split decision. I won the split decision. With your bell rung and stuff. And then afterwards- With my bell rung, yeah, yeah, with my bell rung. And then we went back into the locker room and uh, it went back into the locker room and I was sitting there and I was like, I don't know, I feel pretty good. And now Robert was sitting beside me. He's like, hey, yeah, that's awesome. I was like, that's awesome. Did I win that fight? He look, Robert looked at me and he's like, did you just ask me if you won the fight? You don't remember winning the fight? I was like, I don't know. I feel like I did. Yeah. But like, yeah, it was fuzzy. It was fuzzy for um, me. And that, that, that was interesting because, you know, it was one of those where, and it came back to me like after the first, you know, that was 10 minutes after the fight. Like I, we were in the locker room 10 minutes after the fight. I was like, adrenalized come you know come, yeah. coming to my senses and then he was like and and then i did start to remember everything and it came back to me and i understood but like i knew boss before that like because Dwayne ludwig bang bang used to train with boss and uh Dwayne and boss came to team quest a couple of times uh but one time specifically the first time I wanted to train with Bang, dude, because Dwayne, first of all, he's super cool, super skilled, and, you know, K1 and all that. So I kind of wanted to see where I was, but I didn't want to disrespect him by trying to go all out or whatever. But um, that was a really great training session with Bang. I got some good licks in on him, and he complimented me afterwards. But, like, like the third round we were doing together, he was getting ready for an MMA fight, but he did just striking rounds with me. Mm -hmm. And... um. So we, we, we landed some stuff, you know, I did some of the stuff that I like to do some fakes and some stuff. And I landed on him a couple of times and then he, you know, he would do his stuff. He'd land on me and I went in on him a little bit more aggressively one time. And then he, when he came back, he rang my bell and I was like, I see where you're going with this, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but it was good. It was an awesome training with bang. He's so good. But anyway, that to say that, you know, boss was there too. boss led a couple of team practices, got to know him a little bit. Uh, one of the IFL things, we went to boss's gym to record some promos. Anyway, I felt I had a pretty decent relationship with boss after that fight with Jay here on, we were at the presser and, uh, and boss was like, he, he was saying he didn't think I won the fight and this. And I was like, gosh, boss, fuck you really, you're going to say that. So, you know, but obviously he's going to pull for his team. 
Sure. But I was like, come on, man. You know, because yeah. I, I really like it. I was disappointed. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it is what it is. He's obviously he's going to say that, you know, Jay, Jay and him are going to say that. And me and, you know, Matt are going to say, no, we won the fight. It was a good fight, close fight, but we won. You know, that's yeah, normal. For sure. It's for just, sure. I just remember thinking, because I like Boss so much. You know what I mean? And then, yeah. Oh, yeah, for oh. sure. He's one of the all time great fighters and great personalities in the yes, sport. Yes, the personalities, especially. Yeah. Yeah. So, Chris, I want to thank you for an absolutely phenomenal interview. It's time that we let you go to your family. Um, you. Because, Sorry about uh, the interruptions. no, not at all, because uh, that's the kind of thing that, as you pointed out in the interview, it is more important. <laughs> but yeah. I feel like the interview and getting your stories on record was important. And I, I thank you for spending a lot of time with me. Um, I'll send you some links when it's up, and uh, hopefully, you get to listen to it and, and think back on that awesome career again one more time. Thank you so much for having me on, Miguel. Yep. Nice to talk to you again, and I'm. I hope I can contribute something meaningful to this. Yeah, for sure. You um, already have, brother. Thank you very thank much. You, Appreciate go, you. go have fun. Bye bye. All right.